Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 30th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018 and remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. As meeting papers are provided in digital format, as always, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. The first item on the agenda is the Committee is invited to consider and agree whether to take Agenda Item 3 on a Fuel Poverty Bill in private. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. That is agreed. Uh, this is now day six of stage two of the planning bill, and once again, I welcome the Minister for Local Government and Housing, Kevin Stewart, and his accompanying officials to today's meeting. Some MSPs who are not committee members but have lodged amendments to the bill will again be in attendance today and are very welcome, and I welcome Alec Rowley at this point. Okay, um, so to start off, I'll call Amendment 58 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with Amendment 58A. Andy, to move Amendment 58 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, I move Amendment 58. Uh, this amendment is connected with amendments in the next group on appeal rights, which we will discuss shortly. Um, but the trigger uh, for such appeal rights in, in, in my name in the next group uh, amendments 59 and 60 depends on the answer to the question in, uh, that pose, that's posed by Amendment 58, namely whether an application is in accordance with the development plan or not. This is the key criteria which determines the eligibility of any determination to be appealed under the provisions of Amendments 59 and 60. Amendment 58 merely requires that as part of a notice of the notice of the Planning Authority's decision on an application, there be included a statement as to whether in the opinion of the Planning Authority the application is in accordance with the development plan. Now, <clears throat> critics, and I've no doubt the Minister himself this morning, uh, have pointed out that this is not an easy judgment to make in many cases in Scotland's highly discretionary planning system. That's a fair criticism in some instances, and it's why the decision in this amendment is left to the authority itself to make as it sees fit. Section 37 of the 97 Act stipulates that in dealing with an application for development, the Planning Authority shall have regard to the provisions of the development plan so far as material to the application and to any other material considerations. Planning authorities are therefore routinely assessing this question, and by obliging them to make a statement on the question, we're also nudging the planning system towards a less discretionary and a more plan-led approach. I support Monica Lennon's amendment 58A. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Monica Lennon to move Amendment 58A and the other amendment. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'll move 58A um, and um, I'll speak to Andy Whiteman's amendment as well. Um, so 58A seeks to add a, a further point of clarification to Andy Whiteman's amendment 58. Um, I believe these amendments will make it necessary for the, the planning authority to give a statement on whether an application is in accordance with the development plan. 58A makes clear that this statement must include an explanation for why they have reached that view. Um, to me, this is quite a, a simple change which will increase transparency in the system and make it clear to the public uh, which applications are in the development plan or not. I know we'll come to the appeals rights later in this session, um, convener. But these amendments um, make sense if we, are, if we will then going to have changes in the appeal system um, and gives more weight to a plan-led approach. Um, I'll come on to my later arguments around appeals, but in the hypothetical situation that we had a system of appeals led by accordance with the plan, it's fair and reasonable that there should be an easy way of accessing that type of information. Um, for example, if there are lots of applications coming forward for development uh, which is approved for, for housing, for example, for sites that are not in the plan, this could also be a useful indicator or, or tool for planners drawing up the development plan about where the plan needs to be amended. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want to...? Yeah, yeah um, th thanks very much. Um, uh, and uh, thank you to <laughs> Andy Whiteman and Monica Lennon. Um, if you just take these uh, two, two amendments by themselves, um, we'll come on to appeals, but the two amendments by themselves don't mention appeals. Um, they merely uh, mention uh, making a statement on whether an application is in accordance with the development plan. Now, we, we uh, used, used to have that system uh, not so very long ago. and. Um, in my view, councils did not find that uh, a very difficult decision to make. It shouldn't be a difficult decision to make. It should be relatively straightforward. Um, and I think um, 
by, by supporting these two, two amendments, it, it, it would actually give uh, more clarity uh, to people. I think um, often uh, members of the public struggle to understand uh, why certain decisions have, have been made. So I think um, uh, by supporting these two amendments, which we, we will do, um, it, it, you know, it'll help to uh, clear things up for people. Um, and what, what, you know, what we want to end up with is, is a system uh, where, that people can trust. Uh, and if, they, if, if by, by supporting these two amendments, I think it will add to that trust, um, and that has to be a good thing. OK, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Minister. Uh, good morning, convener. Um, superficially, uh, amendments uh, 58 and 50A seem fairly minor and straightforward, setting out what a planning authority must state in its decision notice. Uh, but there are two important reasons why I do not support um, these amendments. Uh, first of all, section 37 of the 1997 Act requires a planning authority to have regard to both the provisions of the development plan and any other material considerations when making a decision on a planning application. Uh, this is a, a long-standing requirement of our planning system. Um, it is at the very heart uh, of the system. Uh, section 25 uh, then provides that the decision on the application is to be made in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Every decision on every application involves the decision maker reaching a conclusion about whether and how the proposed development accords with the development plan. Uh, the decision maker also has to consider that alongside an assessment of other material considerations and then decide whether they individually or collectively outweigh the position with development plan conformity. And authorities are already required uh, by Section 43.1a of the 1997 Act uh, to give reasons for their decision in the decision notice. In addition, uh, the planning authority must place a report on the register of applications setting out the provisions of the development plan and the other material considerations to which they have had regard in making their decision. So the full basis and context for a decision must already be recorded. Conformity with the development plan is only part of the picture. Um, secondly, uh, I'm concerned about the way it has been proposed, including in these amendments, uh, which we will discuss in the next group, that appeal rights should be linked to whether the development is in accordance with the development plan. While in some cases it will be relatively clear whether a particular proposed development is in accordance with the development plan, in many others this will not be the case. Uh, in these cases, whether a proposal accords with the development plan can involve complex and finely balanced interpretation and professional judgment, and different parties can reach different, yet both entirely reasonable views. While the development plan is key uh, in guiding and directing future development, it cannot it cannot anticipate or allocate land for every possible scenario for future development. Sometimes very reasonable proposals can come forward that have not been considered or led through the plan. Development plans may contain broad statements of policy, uh, some of which may lend support to a particular development, while others may do the opposite. So in that particular case, one must give way to another. In addition, uh, the provisions of a development plan may be framed so that their application to particular circumstances requires the exercise of judgment by the planning authority. Uh, there may reasonably be a difference of opinion on the question, and that may be the key point on which an appeal turns. So it cannot be appropriate to use the authorities' judgment on that point on the criterion for whether their decision can be appealed. Uh, as Ms Lennon is well aware, 
Uh, planning is both a science and a, an art, uh, and decisions are often complex and multifactored. It is not a simple tick box exercise with a pass or fail mark. I want to see good planning decisions uh, being made thoughtfully and transparently, taking into account all of the relevant issues and respecting the professional judgment of planners and the democratic remit of elected members. I'm happy to look at how we can improve transparency and to help people understand the basis on which decisions have been made. Uh, but these amendments are based on and contribute to an oversimplified understanding of the process by focusing on just one part of the story of any application and the decisions made on it. And I would ask the committee to reject these amendments. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Andy, to wind up on Amendment th 58. <coughs> Thanks very much. Convener, the Minister just concluded by saying they focus on one part of the story. They absolutely do focus on one part of the story. They focus on the part of the story that is incredibly important, and that is the <coughs> development plan. Um, and we are trying to pass legislation here that strengthens the role of de the, the development plan. I, and I think some of my colleagues, would also like to see quite a big shift towards a much more plan-led system with much less discretion. The Minister points out correctly that decision makers make their decisions as to whether um, an application should be granted or not um, with respect to the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. And that's absolutely correct. And he's correct to say that um, these other considerations play into the decision. That's absolutely correct. And there's nothing in this amendment that suggests otherwise. All this amendment seeking to do is place a duty on the planning authority to include a statement a statement as to whether their decision, um, whether the application, whether their decision on an application accords with the development plan, which is one bit of the story, but an incredibly important bit of the story. It leaves that judgment to them and them alone. Um, and as Graeme Simpson said, it helps, assists uh, the public to understand the perfectly reasonable um, cases the minister cites where for a variety of reasons, a departure from the plan may be well in order. Because it's linked to appeal rights, it is precisely those circumstances where effort has gone into making a plan, departures are made, possibly for very good reasons, and that's the trigger, as we'll get on to in the next group, for having a second look um, at it. So I think uh, it isn't one part of the story, but it's a very important part of the story, and I hope that over time uh, an assessment of the extent to which applications are actually in accordance with the plan will actually help the plan-led system and help the process of developing development plans. Okay, thank you. Uh, Monica Lennon to wind up and press or withdraw on Amendment 58.8. Thank you, convener. Um, I agree with, with Andy Whiteman. Um, and I think this is, this is really simple. It's about um, being able to on the part of the planning authority, um, provide a statement of fact. It's not about rehearsing all of the arguments again about an individual application. It's once that decision has been taken by the planning authority, it's a simple statement of fact. Was this decision in accordance with the development plan or not? And to provide a reason. Now, that commentary will be set out, uh, you know, usually in a, in, a, in a committee report, but rather than have the public scour through dozens and dozens of sheets of paper and go on planning portals is, is to have um, a simple point of reference that, that says whether or not something was in accordance with the development plan or not. Um, I fully appreciate that, that there's a lot of skill involved in professional judgment and not everyone will accept the decision or, or the reasoning, but this is about the planning authority being accountable for a decision that it has taken and to give a simple statement of fact. Does it accord with your development plan or not, and on a lot of occasions it won't, and you know, we have to accept that in a highly discretionary uh, planning system. Um, but this is not, as others have said, I think Graeme Simpson's remarks, um, this is an onerous on planning authorities. Um, it's probably a neat way to provide a bit of closure to, to any given applica <laughs> application. So um, I'll be moving the amendment, convener. Thank you very much. In that case, the question is that Amendment 58A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 58A? It's four. Those opposed? Three. Uh, the amendment is agreed to.
Andy Whiteman to press a withdrawal <laughs> amendment 58. Press. Thank you. The question is that amendment 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of amendment 58? <laughs> Four. Those opposed? Three. Amendment 58 is agreed to. I call amendment 262 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 259. Minister, <coughs> to move formally. Uh, moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that amendment 262 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Amendment 262 is agreed to. I call amendment 51 in the name of Alec Rowley, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Alec Rowley, to move amendment 51 and speak to all amendments in the group. Alec. Um, and then move 51 and also speak to amendment 92 in my name. In terms of the planning process, I heard the Minister say that it's a science and a, an art. It has to be transparent and people have to have confidence in that system that that system does deliver. And whilst these, these amendments will need tidying up uh, if, 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 if we go to stage three, the principle that sits behind these is based on experiences that I've had firsthand, but also experiences that many, many people have told me. There is an argument that says that if the planning system is front-loaded and set up, in a way that is transparent, then communities will have the opportunity to input, uh, have their say uh, through a democratic process that will then then go to uh, councillors uh, and members as members of the planning committee, indeed councillors more generally, and that uh, that system will then produce a local development plan that's come out of what people wanted to say, what people have inputted to, communities have inputted to. Uh, so we've all had our say and we then have a development plan that sets the way forward for our communities. However, in my recent experience with the development plan in Fife, the ink was hardly dry on the paper of that plan when the developers started to put in applications uh, for for, for housing development that was out with the local plan, that land that had not been included, land that initially uh, the developers and landowners had tried to get in, but through the consultation process, front-loaded, communities had held local consultation meetings with the planning authority, had been able to put their views forward, the uh, local Council had then been able to area committees and then Council had been able to um, have their say in that. And yet that all just seemed worthless. It seemed like it, it had meant nothing because at the end of the day, along comes a developer, makes a different kind of argument, uh, even though the authority then refused the application on the grounds that it's and the material grounds that it's not within the local development plans, it's able to be called in by the Scottish Government reporter and it's able to be approved. And we've seen that in Inverkeaton, we've seen that in Aberdour, we've seen that in many parts of Fife, and I'm sure we've seen it in many parts of Scotland. So basically what this says is that if the argument about front, front loading the consultation is a correct one and people are involved in that, and then despite, despite that, the developer comes in with an application either as, as 92, the Amendment 92 would say, there should be no right of appeal for development that's not on land allocated within for development within the development plan or 51 which would say that if the land has not been uh, included for consideration within the the development plan then equal right appeal should apply to those who have put their objections in have been part of the process but seem to be ignored at the last point so that, that really is the main argument here. If you accept the principle of front-loading, you accept that and you argue that people will have the opportunity to be involved, they will have the opportunity to shape the development plan for the future, then surely it cannot be right that that plan can just be ignored even when the ink's not dry, the developer can come in and apply it regardless, and that they have the right to appeal, but those who have been involved in that process have no rights. 
That is the principled argument upon which I am putting this forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, Andy Whiteman to speak to Amendment 59 and other amendments. Uh, thanks very, convener. Thanks very much, convener. Um, as members know, there has been a long debate about whether to reform appeal rights in the Scottish planning system. Current appeal rights date from 1947. Uh, 70 years ago, when applicants, who were typically landowners themselves, uh, were suspicious of the ability of public authorities to make decisions about development uh, that they themselves had hitherto uh, made. So the right to develop one's own property was being removed from the owner. This was the nationalisation of development rights. It was a radical step, a very welcome step. And but because that happened, it was conceded that a right of appeal should be granted against any refusal to grant planning consent. Today we have a, a highly developed uh, plan-led system, and there is no requirement for appeals to be universally available um, to applicants. Equally, there is a strong argument to provide a limited right of appeal to third parties. The debate on third-party right of appeal has moved on considerably since the 2006, uh, the debate around the 2006 Act, and is now focused on equalising the rights of appeal by firstly providing a limited right of appeal to third parties and by restricting the existing right of appeal to applicants. In a proper plan-led system, there should be no right of appeal at all. The plan should make clear what is permitted and what is not, but we are still in the world of discretion, material considerations and un unallocated sites. My amendments 59 and 60 uh, mirror each other. Amendment 59 provides that where a planning authority give notice that an application is not in accordance with the development plan under the provisions of Amendment 58 just debated, then the existing appeal rights of applicants would be removed. In other words, there is no right of appeal on an application that violates the development plan, the instance that Alec Rowley uh, indicated. The right of appeal remains open to applicants where a planning authority refuse consent for an application which is in accordance with the development plan. So such a move will strengthen the plan-led system and provide greater clarity and certainty as well as eliminating confusion and delay at the end of the process. As Malcolm Fraser, the architect, told us in his stage one evidence, and I quote, as an architect, I've been told many times by planners that they're going to turn something down, but I will win on appeal. That is simply unacceptable. It extends the process, allows developments to become worse, allows lawyers and consultants to make money out of the tail end of the process, and holds back development." End quote. Amendment 60 introduces a similar right to third parties to appeal determinations in the circumstances set out in 2b, most particularly where consent is granted to an application that is not in accordance with the development plan and where a decision is made on land in which the planning authority has an interest. Such rights of appeal are open only to those who made representations on the application or a community council. Now, this debate has matured over recent years, and in conversations with members, I'm aware that some people are still regarding this as framed in the terms it was 10 years ago. It's abundantly clear that the current system of appeals is undermining local democratic decision-making by allowing legitimate decisions to be appealed against the wishes of local communities whose planning authority is upholding agreed plans. It's time to grasp this nettle. The proposals outlined in 59 and 60, as well as in Monica Lennon's Amendment 143, represent a proportionate, a limited and a logical framework within which to modernise appeal rights. With regard to Alex Rowley's Amendment 51, um, I won't be voting for this because it leaves open the possibility of anyone who made representations on an application appealing the decision if, in their opinion, the decision breaches the local development plan. Leading, leaving it up to the opinion of individuals is not appropriate and risks undermining the legitimate decision-making process of the planning authority. And finally, convener, I just want to speak briefly to Amendment 325, <coughs> uh, which I'll, I'll not be uh, moving. It's a, a, a probing amendment. There are several undeveloped elements of it, but it's complete enough to serve its purposes to explore what might be done, what might be done in relation to planning determinations where these are subsequently found to have been made by persons found guilty of criminal offences in connection with the decision-making process. And I would welcome the Minister's comments on that. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 143 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, each time the committee has debated the, the planning uh, bill, I've had to refer to my register of interest. Uh, in order to stick to the, the Parliament's rules, but the relevant interest being that I'm a member of the Royal Town um, Planning Institute. 
I started studying to be a planner over 21 years ago, and I didn't expect that I'd be sitting here in our national parliament uh, helping to shape our, our planning laws. Um, you could say that my gravitation into politics is a, an unintended consequence uh, of um, what attracted me into planning in the first place, but also what has frustrated me about the planning system. Um, planning excites me, and I think it excites a lot of us because of the possibilities it can unlock. It's about making decisions today uh, that will lead to better places tomorrow, but also for generations to come. But I said that planning also frustrates me. Even when I was 16 and starting my planning studies, I realised that whilst planning decisions affect all of us, the planning system has to be accountable to all of us, and in reality, too often, planning decisions and processes satisfy powerful interests. And I'm sure we can all think of examples where this has led to, to planning outcomes that don't best serve the needs of, of people and communities. We can't go back and change these decisions, but we can rebalance the system. I have argued for a purpose for planning in the bill because I believe we have to be clear that planning is about the public interest. It doesn't exist simply to serve the, the wishes of applicants or those who pay a fee. I've argued for a rights-based approach to planning. I've talked about the importance of being serious about equality and equality impact assessments being one tool that planners can use and also you know, properly realising that planning has an important role, a unique role in improving public health. These are important principles that planning can deliver on in practice. Now, I appreciate that not everyone around this room has agreed with me on my amendments, and there are some proposals that I know I'll need to keep working on at stage three. We could go back to the official report from 2005, and many of us have done so, and Whilst we can see that planning has modernised, there remains a lot of frustration. Front-loading was supposed to be a step change, and it was supposed to empower communities. In the evidence that the committee has heard, very few communities have said that this has all worked in practice. Now, I strongly believe that in any um, regulatory system, you need to have appropriate checks and balances. And in planning, we have an appeal system I don't want to abolish the appeal system. I know some people do, but I don't accept it's credible either to keep the status quo. In the main, the evidence that we've heard um, from people who want to keep things exactly um, as they are are people who make appeals and who not always, but uh, often benefit from the appeal system and they want it to be left alone. They don't want the bill to, to even look at it or talk about it. Others, um, I would say, like some planning authority staff, are, are nervous of, of change. In fact, they're nervous of any change in the bill because they're already feeling under-resourced and overworked and under pressure, and they're nervous about what some of these changes would bring. Um, but in speaking to Amendment 143 in, in my name, I, I want to emphasise that I don't think it's credible, if we're serious about planning reform, to ignore the appeals system. Um, as I said, there's lots of people who argue that um, giving communities a right of appeal would lead to more conflict in the system. And I think that's, that's really unfair. And I would like to thank uh, members of public who are in the gallery, but also the, the hundreds of people who have been emailing us. And, you know, sometimes people unfairly characterise communities and... and, and um, Sort of brush people off as, as being nimbies, you know, not in my backyard, people who are against development. And I can see Kenny Gibson nodding, and I know he has concerns about that. And we know there are some people uh, who think very selfishly and about only their own interests. But I have to say, the emails that we have had to people in this room, um, they represent the diversity of people across Scotland. We've had people email today to say they can't come in because of childcare reasons. We've got older people, people with disabilities who have not been able to come into Parliament for this early start this morning. We've got people with expertise, people who have worked in the system. So in speaking to the, the amendment, I think it's been important to set out some of the, the background to this because 
When people talk about appeals, we're often criticised that we're only focusing on the very end of the process. But what I've tried to say is that for people who engaged in this in 2005, and it's a lot of the same people who have come back to give evidence, they were willing to give the, the reform a chance to, to put their faith in front loading, and, and it hasn't worked. So my proposals um, want to reform the system, to look at how we can strengthen a plan-led approach. Um, in my view, that involves not removing an applicant right of appeal, but that should be more limited in scope, and that should be linked to the development plan. So if applicants are being told at an early stage, this is not in the plan, particularly if it's a fairly new plan, then they take their chances. Yes, they can make their, their application, but they forfeit their right to appeal. And we've already had, I think, last week a debate about repeat applications, and we've heard a lot of evidence about the pressure it puts on the system, on communities, when uh, applicants keep coming back to try and um, wear down planners. But I look back at 2005 and I looked at the debates um, and I sympathise with the decisions that were taken, but we've, we've really shifted since then. You know, the Scottish Government has to be commended for the approach it's taken on, on community empowerment. I think a lot of us would agree with, with that approach. But we have to get away from looking at communities as the third party in the planning system. And that's why my amendments seek to equalise appeals, to try and put things on not an exactly equal footing, but more of an even footing. And that's why I think it is time that in certain circumstances, we <coughs> allow communities a right of appeal. Um, the amendment is proportionate. It's not for every application. It's not about a form of mediation between neighbours or looking at very minor changes. It is thinking about the major, the national applications, which can have the long-lasting impact that we've all talked about. We all want our planning system to have the best reputation, to lead to the best outcomes. If an applicant has a seriously good uh, proposal, which has merit, which might not completely stick to the development plan, but it has merit, they shouldn't be frightened of a second look at that, that proposal. Um, so I, I know today that uh, myself and, and, and Andy Whiteman, who ha have votes here, would probably don't have the majority of votes, but I hope that um, whatever side of the debate that people are on, they will respect the evidence that we've heard from communities and all their diversity from every part of Scotland and that we're not just going to close down the debate today and I hope that we can find um, some compromise at stage three because I don't think that it's credible, I don't think it does justice to our planning system if we try and shut down this debate and, and, and don't um, seek to make any changes at all to, to planning um, appeals. I would like to see overall a, a reduced number of, of planning appeals because I can see that they do um, have resource implications for, for planning authorities, um, especially when um, there's, there's quite a long process. Um, I know of an, an example in my own community where the, the appeal sat with the Directorate of Planning and Environmental Appeals for, for over a year. Now, I, I won't go into detail about that one. I believe it's a, it's a, it is a live issue, but that's a situation that's been, uh, you know, worrying the community in my area since 20. 13 for something that was speculative, not in the development plan, doesn't have merit, doesn't uh, meet national guidelines and is having an impact on some of the most vulnerable people, people that, that we want to protect. And I don't think it's a good use of, of anyone's time, including the minister's time, for these kinds of applications to keep coming back. It undermines confidence. I think Alex Rowley kicked off by talking about confidence. If we want to improve confidence in the planning system, System, we have to reform the appeals system. Thank you for your indulgence, convener. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, uh, excuse me, this is not a football match. Can we have no applause and try and keep it as quiet as you possibly can? Right there, thank you. Uh, Alec Cole Hamilton to speak to Amendment 319. <coughs>
Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to be back with you today. Um, so I'm going to speak to you and move Amendment 319 in my name. Um, this amendment really sets out Liberal Democrat policy on appeals rights. This has been arrived at um, over several party conferences, uh, discussion with our council groups, our activists and uh, experts that we have within the planning uh, arena. And the amendment would seek to bring an end to reporters being able to arrive at a completely different decision from that reached by elected local councillors on a planning committee based on exactly the same policies, material considerations and background information. Instead, reports could only assess whether the determination by a planning committee had been reasonable. Uh, this would mean reporters would no longer be able to change or reverse a decision uh, that was reasonable. There is already an established reasonableness test, which the committee will be aware of, which is used for determining whether costs should be awarded against the council to the appellant. So we're not really um, creating anything terribly new here. And if the grounds of, for appeals are limited to challenging unreasonable decisions by elected councillors, then we would also reduce the chance of developers automatically uh, appealing in the hope that a remote official who is perhaps unconnected to the communities affected will come to a different conclusion. Very much uh, are happy to take an intervention from Andy White. Uh, uh, thank, thank, thank the member, and I, I apologise for not addressing his amendment in my, my opening remarks. I had intended to. But the language that's used here, manifestly unreasonable in all the circumstances, and particularly <laughs> a reasonable person acting reasonably in those circumstances could have made that decision. They, they, um, they speak to me of the Wednesbury unreasonableness test in judicial review. Is this not more appropriate as a test as, as a, a process of the lawfulness of decision making rather than the merits of an application on appeal? Well, as I said in my earlier remarks, we already have a reasonableness test in planning appeals based on um, the, where costs uh, are awarded. Um, so I, I don't think we're, we're necessarily um, reinventing the wheel here in, in terms of reasonableness and, and I defer to the member's superior knowledge on this and, he, he, and I'm grateful to him for his um, tutelage in, in the course of this bill um, but, but this I, I think is not to the extent that Andy Whiteman is describing. Um, I am grateful for his intervention, I think it's important to clarify. Um, we have consistently made, the Lib Dems have consistently made the case for decisions being made closer to the people affected uh, affecting them um, and uh, local authorities and local communities and communities currently feel disenfranchised and we've heard a lot of that today and people in the uh, audience uh, or, or the public gallery believe that too um, by the current system of appeals with appeal decisions taken centrally by Scottish government reporters and by ministers members of the community who have been fully engaged during the earlier stages feel excluded from this stage and it fails to respect uh, local decision making and ensure communities have a real voice in the decisions that affect them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, Annabel Ewing. Hey, thank you. Convener, um, yes, I've listened carefully to the uh, members in terms of the, the amendments being put forward, but I'm afraid I would not be able to support these amendments uh, today. Uh, and in, in saying so, I note that, in fact, in terms of one of the many um, emails we have received on, on the subject of third-party right of appeal, um, I note that the following um, take the same view, and that is the convener of the Royal Town uh, Planning Institute, uh, Scotland, the Heads of Planning Scotland, Homes for Scotland, Institution of Civil Engineers Scotland, the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, Scottish Mediation, Scottish Property Federation, Scotland's Town Partnerships, Planning Aid Scotland, and Scottish Renewables, and that's just to, to list some. Uh, as a matter of law, the, the planning system has, uh, in terms of its design, um, on the one hand, the role of, of government, so of local planning authorities, of ministers, of civil servants, representing the broad public interest. And on the other hand, you have the interests of the private applicant. So that is, in, in, in essence, how the planning system is designed. Now, can there be improvements? Certainly. Um, the, planning, the planning system, as the bill <laughs> makes clear, is not a contest between decision makers and private interests. It's a bill about making provision about how land is developed and used. The, the private interest of the applicant is irrelevant in the planning system. 
The planning system is about how we allocate land in the public interest. Okay, but at its core, the participants in the planning system are those players and they have their respective uh, interests. Uh, and what I was going on to say was uh, that um, do I think that the planning system can be improved? Absolutely. Do I think it should be improved? Absolutely. And I have received, of course, representations from uh, those uh, constituents of mine who have a strong opinion on the subject, many constituents having been affected by uh, uh, serial applications and so forth. And they have a very strong view, of, of, and I have recently had a discussion with some of them, uh, uh, about the matter of third party right of appeal. So I do believe strongly that the planning system should be improved, but I do see in the bill a number of important uh, improvements to ensure that individuals can indeed make their voices heard. So we see the front-loading uh, approach of engagement that the bill uh, proposes and the role of the local place plan. Uh, and I also understand that there will be new statutory guidelines, guidelines on effective community engagement that will be produced in due course, and I would look forward to the Minister uh, clarifying that point uh, when he gets to his contribution. Um, I also understand that the, um, the independent planning review panel uh, was more in favour of the front-loading of engagement, of, of engagement on the part of, of local people, rather than on introducing more appeals uh, 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 to the process and at the end of the process. Uh, and uh, in terms of the important issue, which I think is a huge bugbear of serial applications, an issue I have already spoken about, I think, last week or the week before last, uh, in committee, I was indeed very pleased indeed to see the, the government minister come forward with an amendment uh, to try to uh, uh, tackle CO applications in the sense that the current discretion enjoyed by the local planning authority, uh, which is a two-year period to refuse to determine under the rule set forth serial applications, that period has now, because the committee voted for it, been extended to a five-year period. And I think that is very important. I think it would also be very important, as I indicated uh, when I spoke about this earlier in committee, that actually local authorities exercise that discretion because I think then they would be serving uh, the interests of uh, the uh, public that they are there to serve much uh, better. Um, I understand that comparisons have been sought to be made with other jurisdictions, but of course seeking to make a, a comparison with another jurisdiction is always fraught with difficulties because when you drill down you see that the other jurisdiction is not a, a, an identical uh, system and there the comparison uh, falls down, I believe, uh, in that regard, it is, I think, worth noting that there is no third party right of appeal anywhere else uh, in the uh, UK. I also believe, uh, convener, just winding up, that the drafting of some of these uh, amendments is really not very clear. And uh, I also think that the fact that some of these amendments take the approach of a carve out, okay, so that there would be a, a third party right of appeal, but only for some people and not for other people. I see that as being, uh, uh, sorry, I'm a lawyer by trade, I see that as being inherently incoherent uh, and actually doesn't really, I suppose, address for those people who feel strongly that there should be a third party right of appeal. It doesn't really meet their interests either. I think it's a halfway house uh, that doesn't really make much sense. And I suppose uh, I'm just kind of winding up, but a brief one would be, yeah. I just wonder, given um, the members, you know, legal background and, and, and expertise, how can we um, improve access to environmental justice for communities who are being subjected to repeat applications, let's just say for incinerators, when an applicant Let's will have in this amendment. okay, but we, the, the, the applicant the, the, appli the applicant week. will be able to well, there's an appeal at the moment, convener. So the applicant will always have that right of appeal. They've got 100% of the appeal rights, and the communities have zero. Where is the justice and balance in that? Um, well, I, as, I, as I said, I mean, those amendments, I was talking specifically about those amendments that seek to, to carve out rights of appeal for third parties so that only some people would get it and some wouldn't get it, depending on the circumstances. I see that as incoherent, and I don't see that that addresses uh, the strongly held... I'm sorry, I really have to wind up. I know other people have comments to make. But on, the, on that uh, issue, I, I don't see that that really addresses the strongly held views of those who believe that there should be, ergo omnes, a third party right of appeal on the issue of environmental rights. Of course, there are protective expenses orders which have played an important role in ensuring access to justice on the part of those seeking to make their case on environmental grounds. In conclusion, uh, convener, uh, I would say uh, that I believe that the general public interest requires that uh, we do see more homes in Scotland and we do see sustainable economic development in Scotland. And for those 
uh, reasons, I fear that these amendments put that at risk and I believe could significantly discourage uh, development and investment in Scotland. And I do not believe that that would be to the benefit of the people of Scotland, all the people of Scotland, and therefore <laughs> I cannot support uh, these amendments as drafted today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Uh, Kenny Gibson. Uh, thank you, convener. <coughs> a number of um, me. Uh, th it's a committee that deals with these issues. Could you please keep quiet at the back, or else I will have to ask. The, uh, I'll just have to clear the public gallery. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Uh, the planning system, in my view, has to deliver much-needed homes, places of work, and facilities, and these often only exist because they have been approved on appeal. Um, Annabel Ewing listed a number of organisations uh, who have uh, made it clear that they are opposed to these amendments. And uh, in evidence, we actually took uh, uh, some compelling evidence from um, one of them, uh, Homes for Scotland, who pointed out that 40% of the houses actually built in Scotland last year would not actually have been built uh, had uh, the, there been no uh, right of appeal. And uh, that's uh, houses that people actually live in, houses that people were employed to actually build. And many of these uh, homes that are subsequently built, uh, they settle in and become uh, well-established parts of the communities. They're often in, in areas of Scotland where there is a chronic uh, housing shortage. Um, What's interesting is that although Monica uh, gave um, her registered interest as being a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute, the Royal Town Planning Institute, as Annabel Young has pointed out, is very strongly against these amendments. And what, for example, uh, excuse me. this is the <coughs> last warning. If anybody else shouts from the public gallery, I will be asking that the, uh, the public gallery is cleared. We're trying to go on with some serious business here. Thank you. For example, some of the points that the RTPI pointed out was that, in their view, these amendments would further widen inequality in our communities by disproportionately favouring those with the capacity, time and resources to pursue an appeal, uh, lead to seldom heard voices in the planning system being further man marginalised, weaken constructive early engagement, which has already been talked about, undermine democratically elected planning authorities' responsibility to ensure planning decisions are taken local in the public interest interests and clog up the planning system. And I should point out, actually, which again we received in, in evidence, is that only 12 per cent of uh, council refusals are actually overturned. 12 per cent. So it's not as if, you know, because there's a third party right of appeal, these are automatically approved. That is not the case uh, at all. And the heads, the heads of planning in Scotland uh, said that, in their view, uh, various proposals to introduce an equal right of appeal or a third party right of appeal will be counterproductive to establishing an effective and efficient planning system which acts in the long term public interest. It will simply make it more uh, complicated, and they go on to repeat some of the other issues which I've already uh, mentioned. I'll just uh, finish with one other thing, which is about what uh, Homes for Scotland said. They, in their view, it would be catastrophic in terms of jobs and investment and house construction here in Scotland. So I would oppose each of the amendments that have been put forward today, Convener. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Uh, Graeme Simpson. Convener, um, I said throughout stage two that I want to see uh, a system where people, not stakeholders, but real people, are fully involved in the planning process so that conflicts are kept to a minimum. I've also said that the bill as drafted does not fit the bill as far as front-loading is concerned. Now, I'm continuing to work on proposals which will improve this. I'll bring them forward at stage three. But there's no doubt whatsoever that the system we have at present is lopsided. Communities are not involved in shaping their areas to any great extent. Developers tick the box of holding ill-publicised and poorly attended pre-application events. And so it's little wonder that people get annoyed when things appar appear apparently out of the blue. Then only applicants can appeal, and we have the situation where one person, a government-appointed reporter, can overturn a democratically taken decision taken locally. It all feels unsatisfactory, so it's little wonder that people want to change the system. Now, running counter to that uh, is the argument, and this also has merit, very well expressed by Annabelle Ewing and Kenny Gibson, that allowing third parties to appeal consent decisions will scare the ho horses and slow up an already <coughs> snail's pace system. So there are, there are valid arguments on both sides, and 
they both need to be heard mm -hmm. with respect. The key question for this committee has been whether equal rights of appeal will lead to a more robust plan-led system which encourages more meaningful upfront engagement and agreement between communities and developers, or that its implementation will lead to delays and reduce early engagement and investment in, in, in housing and development. The government has not really addressed any of this. It wasn't mentioned in the bill. Now, in our manifesto uh, for the local government elections last year, we said that we should be stopping central appeals if applications uh, and decisions uh, are, are in line with development plans. That's why we supported amendments 58 and 58A, uh, and that those uh, appeals should only be heard in full council uh, or by a local appeals committee. So it's dealing with things locally. Now, let me be frank about where we are as a party on this. We've got differences of opinion on appeal rights. Uh, I'm just being upfront about that. Uh, those same differences exist within the SNP and Labour. They always have. We'll come to a view, but for now we're keeping our counsel. And for most of these amendments, we will abstain. I can assure you that we'll be demanding changes for stage three that put people, real people, not stakeholders, not the vested interests that I described in the stage one debate, not the minister or his civil servants, not the planning industry bloggers who think they know best, but real people at the heart of the planning system. I've got ready-made amendments. Uh, if none of this is sat comes to my satisfaction, it will really be up to the minister to uh, engage on this. I want to see a system which delivers development in the right places and with a maximum community buy-in. The bill does not deliver that. Um, so far from shutting down the debate, as Monica Lennon suggests, I think the debate needs to continue. Um, there's still much work to do, but we must get this right for stage three. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Uh, Alexander. Thank you. I, I, I concur with many of the comments my colleague uh, Graham Simpson has said uh, this morning. Uh, this is a very passionate debate. Uh, communities, the length and breadth, have made representations. Uh, we've already heard uh, from others that organisations uh, have also made their views very uh, plainly known. Uh, and they all perceive that there's flaws in the system. Uh, and the system requires to be, to be managed going forward. But at the present moment, you know, there is potentially the opportunity to stifle development. Uh, there is also the opportunity that communities do not feel that they are part and parcel of the process and are not being given the opportunities that they want to see uh, going forward. So I think it is vitally important that we look at this and we continue to look at where we are here. Uh, it's too important for us to get it wrong and there should not be any knee-jerk reactions to it. Uh, this, this whole process uh, will upset people, there's no question about that. Uh, uh, we, we, we've had lots of uh, information and lots of correspondence and people are very passionate about it. So we as individuals here on this committee have a duty and a responsibility to ensure that we can do all we can uh, within that process. Remember so take an intervention. Happy to do so. I'm grateful to, to Alexander Stewart. Um, I might also add that I'm the convener of the, the Construction Cross Party Group. So I'm very... Um, um, you know, motivated to see that we do have the right development and we do have the right infrastructure for, for Scotland. Now, today we're, we're hearing both sides and we're hearing about some of the behaviours that um, people perceive or are seeing in their communities. And I wonder if there's an opportunity for some of the stakeholders and the, the, I suppose the establishment that has been rhymed off to, to think about that. Because when um, the, the 2006 Act was passed, it did bring in measures to front load, to have that early engagement. Graeme Simpson talked about you know, these poorly attended community meetings. We've got to think why that is. And if people continue to believe that that's a tick box exercise. Would Alexander should agree there's an opportunity for um, Homes for Scotland to speak to their members and other organisations to try and do something about that before we get to stage three? I, I would agree. I think that there needs to be much more dialogue and much more discussion and much more debate on this whole process uh, because we want to ensure that we get it right for the communities and the individuals and organisations. Uh, and at the moment, we are stuck in that situation, which I do not believe we are at that stage of actually getting it 
uh, correct. So we need to go back and rethink and we need to go back and, and discuss. Uh, and I hope that that can take place so that we, we do come forward to the next stage and we have proposals that we can all sign up to and we feel more comfortable signing up to because of the community and because of representation we have, a, we have had so far. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. Uh, <laughs> Minister. Uh, there's a lot for me to get my teeth into there, um, convener. Um, let me um, start off with some of the comments made by uh, members. Um, and uh, let me start with uh, Mr. Simpson, uh, because yesterday I noticed that Mr. Uh, Simpson tweeted um, about a survey of his that highlights the importance of engaging with local people uh, relating to an application for planning permission in principle. Um, and I won't go on uh, around about the individual application because I don't know where it is at the moment. Um, I completely and utterly agree that uh, effective and meaningful engagement with people uh, across our communities is vital. Uh, to properly understand the views, the aspirations and the strength of feeling uh, and not just uh, to hear from those that shout the loudest. Uh, and the committee, uh, I, I certainly will. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, you um, helpfully mentioned my uh, tweet. Um, and, and just to give you the background to that, 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 that was uh, an application which hadn't been made uh, at that point. Um, to d develop on an area uh, of land in North Lanarkshire. Now, I, dis I, I figured out that the uh, potential developer would not have told many people about this, and that was true. I leafleted um, a very large estate, uh, making people uh, aware of the application, not, uh, not say saying what they should think one way or the other, telling them about the pre-application uh, meeting, um, lots of people then turned up to that meeting. Uh, lots of people, far more than would have done, um, expressed a view to the council. It was probably 50-50. Now, the developer in that case, I won't say who it was, was grateful that I had done that. And part of the, part of the problem, um, and I've discussed this with big builders recently, is that they're not, they're not reaching out, they're not telling enough people what's coming up. Because if you do, they're not necessarily going to be against what you've got planned. You need, you need to work with them, and it's not happening at the moment. I don't agree with any of that, convener, and I do these kind of things regularly within my own constituency um, and did so um, as a, a, a councillor. And um, uh, Ms Ewing mentioned uh, effective uh, community engagement and further guidance, and um, I can assure her that we will be doing everything possible uh, to ensure that we get this engagement right. Um, the committee has already agreed in a, a, an amendment uh, brought by Graham Simpson uh, in relation to guidance and effective community community engagement, uh, and I was happy to support that, um, because I do think that this is the right way forward. Um, and I've told uh, this story on a, a number of occasions, um, convener, but you know, you do, you do reach situations uh, which uh, sometimes are a little bit confusing. Um, I went into a, a room at a very early stage of being appointed to this current post, um, and an older woman there uh, told me uh, straight off, Housing Minister, you need to build more houses here. Uh, and the next sentence was, you kind of build them here, 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 and here. Um, and one of the things which I've talked about is the level of engagement that we have with community, uh, in terms of community planning, um, where we actually give reasons and set parameters about why certain things need to be done um, in areas, um, the areas need certain things. Um, we should be looking to do the same thing with spatial planning uh, and that community, bring that level of community engagement up to the kind of engagement level that happens uh, in community planning, um, particularly um, in, in certain areas of the country uh, where uh, they are really um, punching above their weight. And there's other things uh, that have been mentioned uh, around uh, 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 about comments that people have made. Um, John Finney uh, said to the committee last week on the 31st of October uh, in terms of, uh, of certain applications uh, that, uh, and I quote here, uh, local people protest and local members follow the view of the community, end of quote. And that can be irrespective 
of the development plan, um, and it, it illustrates why um, the right of appeal uh, remains a key key to the planning uh, system. And that may be um, a, a similar kind of situation uh, to what Malcolm Fraser had in mind um, when he was uh, talking uh, to the committee. I don't want to assume anything, but it might well be um, that that was uh, the kind of situation um, that he was um, talking about. I want to see um, stronger uh, clearer development plans. I want to see elected member training so that uh, elected members know exactly um, uh, what, what uh, to expect and what is required. Uh, and I do want to see um, performance provisions, because I believe that all of this together um, can lead to a reduction uh, in the need for appeals uh, by applicants uh, in the future. Um, it, it comes... I'll take Mr Whiteman, yeah. If the Minister believes that that would lead to a reduction, why can't he see the argument for um, making that reduction something that's reflected uh, in the bill itself? Because at the moment, um, basically an appeal can be made uh, by any applicant. So whilst I would agree and I would hope that there would be fewer of them, it seems uh, reasonable to attempt to secure that intention on, on the face of the bill? I, I think that in order to get to fewer appeals, uh, we need to go along the path that Mr Simpson uh, is talking about, that early engagement scenario. That um, scenario um, has been uh, uh, agreed uh, by others as well of, as, uh, uh, as the government itself, uh, and I'll, I'll use this quote, uh, all of us agree uh, that we need to bring people and planning closer together uh, to agree a shared vision for the places in which we live, work and play, uh, rather than simply opposing what we do not wish to see. However, uh, our, members, uh, our members agree with the Scottish Government's position that changing arrangements for planning appeals is not the means by which we can best hope to achieve this outcome. Uh, and that uh, uh, is a quote from uh, Henry MacLeish, who is the uh, Scottish Alliance for People and Places chair, um, and it includes a number of the organisations um, that has already been mentioned by other members. Um, uh, further to that, um, Petra Bieberbach of PAS um, has said that I would say that a third party right of appeal exacerbates conflict. It undermines the goal of very early engagement, which is what we want to see between all parties, and it would undermine a plan led system. Um, the government itself, convener, uh, its position has been uh, quite clear on uh, third party uh, right of appeal, equal right of appeal. Uh, quite simply, we do not support its introduction, nor do we support any restrictions on the current right of appeal. Uh, the government's views are well known uh, and are supported by a range of stakeholders, many of them who have already been mentioned, and I will not uh, go through all of those again. Uh, and there are many community groups who want to see investment and improvement in their areas, but who could see their ambitions hampered um, by additional appeals. Um, I would like to set the record straight and clarify uh, that this issue was explored during the review, the independent review of the planning system. There wasn't a specific question on it uh, because the panel asked much broader questions about engagement. Uh, those support, who support an equal right of appeal made their views known through both written and oral evidence to the panel. Um, having taken into account the available evidence, uh, the independent panel concluded at recommendation 46 of their, the, their report that they were not persuaded uh, that third party rights of appeal should be introduced. Uh, and they stated that effective planning depends on building positive and productive relationships. Uh, I'll take a very brief intervention from Mr. But Whiteman. I've got a lot to go through here, convener. Just very briefly. Does the 
Minister, does the Minister accept that the independent review did not look at the applicant right of appeal? No, I, I do want to accept that, and I've just said that. There wasn't a specific question on it, um, because the panel asked much broader questions, um, but those questions uh, were asked. If I can continu continue um, with the, the quote from the recommendation, uh, the evidence shows that a third party right of appeal would add time, complexity and conflict to the process and have the unintended consequence of centralising decisions, undermining confidence and deterring investment. And the panel concluded uh, that it would be much more beneficial uh, to use available time and resources uh, to focus on improved early engagement. And I agree, and that is what we have sought to do in this bill, uh, and we will continue uh, to look at ways that that can be improved, and I'm more than happy uh, to work with Mr Simpson and other members to get to that point. Um, I carefully considered what the committee said about appeals um, in its stage one report. And I do recognise that many communities feel frustrated uh, by the planning system. Uh, and I've acknowledged, um, and here again today, uh, that we can do more to build uh, on the community involvement uh, that we have seen to date. Um, like the committee, I want people to be involved in planning, uh, as well as having opportunities to say what they think. People need to know they have been properly listened to. But I'm certain that introducing new rights of appeal or restricting the current right of appeal is not the answer. In fact, I am absolutely convinced that it would do the opposite. It would create conflict and undermine efforts to improve trust in the planning system. It would add uncertainty, it would undermine local democracy, it would be divisive, uh, and there would be no impetus to engage in earlier participation. Uh, the idea might be seen to be politically appealing, but it would be disingenuous to suggest that introducing this right of appeal would mean that people will automatically get the decision they are looking for. An additional right of appeal does not change the circumstances that led to a decision being made in the first place. An experience in Ireland shows very few decisions are wholly reversed as a result of third party appeals. Uh, some of these amendments also seek to restrict the current applicant's right of appeal. Uh, and I would remind the committee why appeal rights exist. Um, it was to ensure that there was appropriate scrutiny of the denial of the right of landowners to develop their land. Uh, that rationale remains as valid today as it did when planning regulation was introduced, perhaps even more so given the pressures we are facing on housing supply and essential infrastructure. And if people who want to provide new housing and facilities are to be refused, those decisions need to be robust. In practice, over the decades, the ability for an applicant to appeal has proven to be vital. Uh, many of our much needed homes, uh, places of work and facilities only exist because they have been approved on appeal. Uh, this is not about big business having some kind of perceived advantage on a playing field. It's about deliver delivery of real people's actual homes and jobs, uh, respecting and balancing public and private interests to deliver the development that we need. And any of these, if any of these amendments are supported, uh, we would be asking applicants to take a leap of faith in the process. At worst, they would have no right of appeal. At best, uh, a right of appeal might exist to be concluded at some future date. Uh, there would be no certainty or clari clarity, and that uncertainty could make or break a decision to invest in Scotland. The rest restricting the current right, right of appeal uh, could deter investment and put Scotland at a commercial disadvantage as investors perceive condi conditions in other parts of the UK to be more favourable, and we cannot allow that to happen. I oppose the amendments in this group on principle, uh, but I will mention some details which are perhaps not as helpful as members intend. 
Andy Whiteman and Monica Lennon's amendments uh, would have rights to appeal for applicants and others dependent on a statement made by the planning authority as to accordance with the development plan. As I have made clear, this is only half of the story of how a decision is made, and it can come down to a matter for interpretation of complex information and careful professional judgment, which may not be universally accepted. This approach also misses that vital ability of our planning system to be able to recognise changing circumstances. Occasionally, uh, there can be very good reasons for making a decision which is not in accordance with the development plan. Uh, for example, uh, where uh, a, a, an emerging draft development plan contains a far more current uh, and relevant policy intent than the ageing plan it is about to replace, but it is not yet the development plan. Or where there is a worthwhile development opportunity which could not possibly have been anticipated when the development plan was prepared. Uh, these can be examples of the planning system working properly and responsibly uh, by allowing there to be exceptions. Alec Rowley's Amendment 51 goes even further. It would place the decision on whether an appeal right exists in any given case firmly in the hands of the person who is seeking to appeal, the very person who has a vested interest in having a right of appeal. Uh, Mr Whiteman's Amendment 60 has a similar provision uh, in which it is up to the appellant to decide whether the grounds for objection by a statutory consultee have been addressed, regardless of the view of the body that made the objection. The only restriction on the right to appeal in these cases uh, would be whether the appellant has made a submission on the application. Uh, it would just take a submission about a planning application for third parties to pre preserve their right of appeal. Rather than making the system more efficient, uh, this would slow it down and discourage the genuine, meaningful, early engagement that we need more of in planning. What is proposed would damage the planning system, create more confusion, conflict and challenge and less certainty and less transparency. Amendment 92, uh, in the name of Alec Rowley, shows a complete misunderstanding of the purpose and content of the development plan. The development plan guides development management decisions. It does not directly authorise or prohibit development. Not all land is allocated for one use or another. Large development sites, for example, large residential development sites which require master planning, may be allocated in the plan. Land required for schools or transport in interventions may be identified. But the plan cannot anticipate every possible development, large or small. So in reality, this amendment would take away the applicant's right of appeal, including for many developments which may be clearly supported by policies of the development plan and so be in accordance with the plan overall. Andy Whiteman's Amendment 325, uh, which I understand he's not going to press today, but I will talk about it because I think it's important that we address some of the issues. And I think maybe one of the reasons for withdrawal um, is because of some of the points that I will highlight. It would have created new appeal rights uh, where there has been maladministration or criminal activity by a member of the planning authority. Um, with the exception of a recent case reported uh, where two councillors were charged, um, this has not been raised uh, as a concern by stakeholders. And I'm not convinced uh, that such conduct is widespread. There has been no consultation with plan planning authorities about this amendment, and there are real impracticalities involved, um, as the right of appeal is not linked to the decision on a particular application, but only arises at the point when the guilt of a member uh, of the planning authority is established. Uh, the right of appeal would have to run from that date and not from the date of the planning decision. In effect, this, me this would mean uh, that it would not be possible to know at the time when a decision is made whether a right of appeal may or may not arise. 
Uh, and by the time any inv investigations and prosecutions have been completed uh, and someone has been found guilty of wrongdoing, it is entirely possible, maybe even likely, uh, that the development may have been completed. In addition, um, there is no requirement that the maladministration or criminal, criminal activity in question need even relate to the particular application in, in question. So I am pleased that Mr Whiteman will not move that today. I am happy to have further discussions with him uh, on this issue, but I do not think that that amendment uh, was suitable. Alec Cole Hamilton's amendment 319 uh, takes a, a, a different approach. Uh, to other proposals in this group. Uh, it would introduce a further restriction on the ability of ministers to deal with appeals. It creates a requirement to consider if the decision of the planning authority is, a quote, manifestly unreasonable. While the proposed subsection 1b makes it clear that a decision would be manifestly unreasonable if no reasonable person could have made the decision, this is without prejudice to ministers being entitled to consider that a decision is manifestly unreasonable in other circumstances. Ministers may reverse or vary decisions of, planning, of a planning authority where they consider it is reasonable to do so. The amendment would serve to add another step in decision making and simply introduce uh, the potential for further grounds of legal challenge to reasons given on appeal decisions. Any party can already challenge a decision in the courts on the grounds that the decision maker has acted unreasonably, but this is a distinct and separate uh, right to the right of appeal. Apologies, convener. Uh, convener, the committee must not underestimate the importance of their decisions on this group of amendments. Uh, they could fundamentally change our planning system and shift the whole focus of this package of planning reforms from greater collaboration to more conflict, very much to the detriment of investment in Scotland. An additional right of appeal may, on the face of it, appear to promise a lot to communities and individuals. But I'm concerned that these claims are at best misguided and at worst misleading. The reality is that an additional right of appeal will simply add time, cost, procedure and conflict to an already stretched planning service. Does the committee really think that the result will be so different? Is it fair to su suggest to communities uh, that this would mean they can expect to overturn decisions and put a block on development? The evidence shows that this will not be the case. Our planning system is inclusive and I want to improve on that, to ensure that people can have a real influence on how their places and communities will develop in future. I welcome the decisions that the committee has already made to support that approach. And if we are serious about delivering the investment and development our communities need, and I most certainly am, we cannot afford to make it more difficult. We have an appropriate balance in appeals rights already. Some are decided by or on behalf of ministers, others by local review bodies. Making these changes proposed in these amendments would take our planning system in entirely the wrong direction. And for all of these reasons, convener, I would urge the committee to reject all of these amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Alec Rowley to wind up and press or withdraw. Thank you, convener. Um, I think there's been a number of valid points made, but the, the one issue that I think is comes through again and again is that for people who have experienced using the planning system, I'm not sure inclusive is always the the word that they would end up making. And the point is, I mean, I, I not only support the, the idea of front-loading the system to engage people, but as a politician I have over many years actively taken action to encourage people to get involved 
in the planning process at the earliest stages. And I have repeatedly done lots uh, uh, in, in the media to try and make the point that if you wait until the application's in that's discussing the colour of the bricks, you're too late. You have to go at a much earlier stage. And that is the point, and I'm disappointed that Andy Whiteman says he can't support uh, the, the amendment that I have put in, because it's the same ar argument I heard Andy make at the Environment Committee a number of weeks ago at stage two, where, where he was putting up some amendments and saying a lot of work would need to be done on this and to get to stage three. And with all these amendments, a lot of work will need to be done on them to get to stage three. I am encouraged a bit by what Graham Simpson has to say, that coming up to stage three, we will have a look again. And I would suggest all the parties, other than the party that's absolutely opposed to listening to the concerns that are being raised by the public, get together before stage three, because there is an issue here. There, there, is, there is a real issue here. You're happy to do so. Um, uh, Mr Riley, I am more than happy to engage with everyone. Um, whether I agree uh, with their amendments or not, I have done so um, throughout this process um, and will continue to do so. Um, I think that many members uh, around the table uh, will tell you the efforts that I've gone uh, to uh, actually uh, ensure uh, that we get to the best possible place. I don't think that third party equal right of appeal is the best place. Well, that's, that's, that's the whole point. You've ruled it out for day one, and you've made clear that, that in principle, you're totally opposed to looking at any aspect to it. The amendment that, that, that I have put forward in 151 actually talks specifically about this, this process where, where you front-loaded the process. When I've spoke to people who have taken part in that process, meeting rooms that have been parked out with local communities taking part in that process, then following it through to the point where the council determined the local plan and have thought, yeah, that process worked, only for a developer to come along before the ink's dry on the paper, fire in an application, take it to appeal, and overrule that and undermine that whole process of front-loading. That's the problem that, that, that I'm trying to address through my amendment. I accept that technically these amendments need to be worked on and could be stronger, but the principle with that is one where at least people, and these are, these are some of the comments that, that I've heard where, where, where that's happened, where people say democracy does not work in planning. They feel cheated, betrayed by the whole planning process and system. And if people feel like that, then we have an issue and we have a problem that the minister and the government and, and, and government party just seem unwilling, completely unwilling to actually take on board. And therefore, that is to ignore communities right across Scotland who have had this, this issue. And, and, and I know that, that Kenneth Gibson raises the issue about the need to build houses. I agree with that. The biggest block to building houses, or one off the biggest blocks to building houses in Scotland, is the lack of upfront infrastructure funding for education, schools, health, leisure, community facilities. That is one of the key blocks. It's not the planning system as such. It's the front loading of infrastructure, something that I have raised with the Minister time and time again. And that's the issue that needs to be tackled if we actually want to release a whole load of land that is already in the plans that needs to be that needs to be built. So 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 I would say in moving and I intend I certainly intend to to move uh, fifty one that all these, all these amendments that are there need work done to them. We need to come together at stage three. There is only one party that... Yeah. Um, I've listened very carefully to Mr Rowley, and we've had conversations about some of the issues with, that he has raised, um, and we will continue to have discussions. And, um, you know, the government has put in place uh, things like the Housing Infrastructure Fund to um, help uh, in some of these regards. Um, Alec Riley, um, convener, has been talking about wanting people to get involved early. That's what I want. I think that's what everybody um, wants. Um, it's, it, it's too late 
um, when the decision is being made. So that's a clear argument why adding further late appeals is not the answer. Now, I'm willing to work with all parties in trying to improve um, the early engagement aspect of all of this as best we possibly can. Uh, and I think that we can do a lot, uh, not only just within this bill, uh, but out with uh, the bill to get more folk involved in the planning process. I've talked previously about intertwining community planning with spatial planning, and I think that is the way of getting more people involved. That is the collaborative approach. Uh, adding more appeals at the end is a recipe for even more conflict. But the, 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 problem, the problem with that is that if, if people feel that spending all that time, energy and often resource and getting involved at the early stages can completely be ignored if a developer doesn't like the outcome <coughs> and they then have the right to appeal, but those who put everything into that process, have no rights, that's where, that's where this breaks down. Indeed, the Minister was quite critical of my Amendment 92. I would have to say that my Amendment 92 uh, came about as a result of discussions I had on my Amendment uh, the first one, the 51, where I think two of the most senior planners in Scotland. So if I've got that completely wrong, I need to stop taking advice for, for very senior planners. I don't intend to move 52, but I certainly intend to move uh, my first amendment. But I would finish by again saying there is only one party it would seem in this parliament that is fundamentally opposed to addressing the concerns that people and communities across Scotland are raising. Therefore, the other parties need to come together, work together, so that at stage three we can address the genuine concerns that are raised in communities across Scotland. And with that, convener, uh, I would want to move the amendment uh, 51. OK, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, and the question, therefore, is that Amendment 51 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 51? Those opposed? Those abstaining? That's two in favour, three opposed and two abstaining. Therefore, the amendment falls. I call Amendment 59 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 51. Andy Whiteman, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? That's two. Those opposed? Three. Those abstaining to the Amendment 59, there falls. I call Amendment 60 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 51. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Two. Those opposed? Three. Those abstaining? Two. Amendment 60 it falls. I call Amendment 92 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 51. Alec Rowley, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 143 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 51. Monica Lennon, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 143 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Those in favour? Two. Those opposed? Three. Those abstaining? to uh, Amendment 143 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 325 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 51. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 319 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 51. Alec Camel Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved, convener. Thank you. The question is, um, Amendment 319 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Uh, amendment 319, therefore, is not agreed. Yes, OK. Uh, all those in favour? Zero. 319. Right. Uh, all those opposed? That's six, seven, seven. Right. Uh, and no <laughs> abstentions, so therefore, Amendment 319 has fallen. I call Amendment 209 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 207. Uh, not, you, not moving. Uh, not moving, thank you. Therefore, the question is Amendment 209. No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> uh, I call Amendment 88 in the name of Andy Whiteman and a group on its own. 
And I'm to move and speak to Amendment 88. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, I move Amendment 88 in my name. In determining planning applications, as we've already discussed, um, planning authorities are required to have regard to the provisions of the development plan, uh, so far as material to the application and to any other material considerations. Material considerations, together with applicant appeals, are what gives the planning system so much discretion to the extent that sometimes the development plan can appear somewhat irrelevant. In order to give greater clarity about the issues that will be taken into consideration in any determination and to strengthen the plan led system, it would be helpful, in my view, to codify in regulations what is meant by material considerations. These, at the moment, are left undefined uh, in law. Uh, and rather like previous debate we had around introducing regulations to govern the circumstances in which call-in powers uh, by ministers can be used, it will be up to ministers and parliament to determine how widely or how narrowly, how extensively or how minimally to describe these material considerations. Those are a, that's a question for a, another day. But once agreed, only considerations that fall within the scope of those set out in such regulations would be material for the purposes of planning determinations under the 97 Act. I stress again, it will be up to ministers and parliament to determine how widely to construe and how widely or narrowly to frame such material considerations. This is a modest amendment to bring greater clarity and certainty to the planning system. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to speak? No, therefore, a uh, uh, minister. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, as I've said before, the inclusion of material considerations uh, is an important and long-standing element in decisions on planning applications. Uh, but there are references uh, to material considerations uh, across multiple provisions of the 1997 Act. For example, when considering appropriate periods for duration of planning permission or revocation or discontinuance of permission or for taking enforcement action. What may or may not constitute a material consideration uh, can be different across these different purposes. Uh, the 1997 Act uh, deliberately leaves the phrase material considerations undefined. It is not, it's just not possible to anticipate and lay down in legislation everything that could be a material consideration in every case or circumstance for all of these purposes. Any list or definition of material consideration is likely either to restrict what planning authorities could consider or to require them to consider issues that may not be relevant to the case before them. Uh, leaving the phrase undefined uh, means it is for the decision maker in the first instance to decide what the material considerations in any given case are. And ultimately, if there is a dispute about it, uh, the courts will adjudicate and independently decide what amounts to a material consideration in a particular case. Um, uh, briefly, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, just for information, really, um, Andy Whiteman and myself um, had a meeting um, with uh, planning conveners at, at, at COSLA. Uh, and Andy Whiteman raised this issue, and I, I just have to tell the minister they were comfortable with what he's proposing. Um, so it doesn't seem to me that uh, councils uh, are against this. Um, I, I would say that uh, myself and officials met with planning conveners uh, yesterday. This was not a topic that was raised. I'm in uh, regular contact with planning conveners, um, I'm more than happy to talk to them. But let me um, uh, go on, because, you know, there has been accusations uh, uh, that this bill is centralising uh, in various ways. Uh, let me be clear here. This power and responsibility that Mr Whiteman uh, wants to take from planning authorities and the courts and give to the government is not one that this government wants. Uh, very, very briefly, very briefly. I just want to clarify, I am not suggesting that ministers have this power. Parliament, Parliament 
would pass these regulations, as Parliament passes all legislation in relationship to planning, and the, 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 uh, the terms of such a regulation can be drawn as widely or narrowly as Ministers and Parliament see fit. Um, whatever way, it's centralisation. Uh, and as, I, as I've said, the key thing in all of this is trying to predict everything that could be a material consideration for every case across all different kinds of case that could arise under the various situations of the 1997 Act that use the expression would be an almost impossible task. Uh, and that is why um, in our published guidance, uh, in our Circular 3 uh, 2013, it contains some examples of possible material considerations in relation to planning applications, but even these are only broad categories, and the circular makes clear the list is illustrative and not exhaustive. Even uh, trying to set some uh, of the scope for material considerations uh, would be unclear. Um, and it could discount considerations that matter, that really matter in decision making. If there are particular matters that Mr Whiteman is seeking to clarify through this amendment, I'd be happy to discuss with him and with others before stage three, or to explore what can perhaps be done through guidance. But I cannot support the amendment as it stands, and I would urge Mr Whiteman not to press it. OK, thank you. Uh, Andy Whiteman, to wind up. The, this, this amendment, I've listened carefully to what the Minister um, has, has to say, and I, I accept that term material considerations um, occurs in a variety of places in the 97 Act. I, th I think given that we're trying to move towards a, a more plan-led system where there's greater certainty and greater confidence in a plan-led uh, system, leaving a term like material considerations uh, undefined uh, is not helpful. I accept that material considerations is a useful, <coughs> very useful uh, part of the planning system. It's a vital part of the planning system. I have no disagreement at all on that with the, uh, with the Minister. But it, it surely is not um, unreasonable uh, to seek to define material considerations via regulations introduced by Ministers to Parliament. And as I say, that definition can be itself very broadly drawn. I mean, that definition could be so broadly drawn as it's almost meaningless. Um, that in itself would probably not help, but <laughs> I'm just illustrating the, the power that this gives to ministers in parliament to draw things as widely or narrowly as they see fit. What the minister is essentially arguing is that this should be an infinitesimal um, discretion. Material considerations could be anything. And I don't accept that. I think material considerations should fall into a prescribed range of circumstances and categories, relatively broadly drawn, and that those should be stated for clarity, such that the guidance the Minister is talking about no longer takes the form of guidance, but takes the form of a statutory uh, regulation. Now, and it's up to Ministers not even to um, introduce um, such a uh, uh, a regulation if they if they if they don't wish to this is this isn't the gift of ministers um, to introduce such um, regulations so I don't really want the gift to be there. <laughs> um, which may not actually be how how it's described here as the meaning prescribed by the Scottish ministers it, it requires Scottish ministers to come up with what a meaning, so it requires regulations. I, I roll back on that a little bit. What I'm trying to say is that that meaning is up to Scottish ministers to, to, to frame. And if Parliament agrees with the minister that it should be uh, continue to be framed very broadly, then I'm sure Parliament will, will consent to that and will have material considerations that remain broadly framed, but at least take the form of a statutory regulation that's been approved by Parliament. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. And are you pressing on withdrawing? Thank you. The question therefore is that Amendment 88 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Those in favour of Amendment 88? Four. Those opposed? Three. Amendment 88 is agreed to.
I call Amendment 263 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 318. Minister, to move formally. Uh, moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 263 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Amendment 263 is agreed to. The question is that Section 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the question is that Section 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <laughs> In that case, we will suspend for a brief period for a natural break.
Okay, I uh, call Amendment 98 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with Amendments 166, 320 and 317. Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 98 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you very much, um, Convener. The, I move Amendment 98 in my name. <laughs> the policy memorandum says nothing about Sections 19 and 20 of the Bill. I, I was advised that this was because the sections introduce no new policy. The explanatory notes do provide an explanation of what's intended, um, and it appears to change, uh, to make reforms to Section 75 of the 97 Act to allow the requirement for payment to be made by an applicant without such a payment being part of an obligation that restricts or regulates the use of land. I uh, spoke to two eminent planning professionals, one working in the public sector and one in the private sector, to ask them what they thought was the uh, meaning and consequence and intent purpose of this of these two um, sections and both uh, sorry I asked them for their view on, on what section 19 uh, does and both gave completely different answers the parliament needs to be clear about what it is legislating on and relation in relation to section 19 Ministers appear to think it makes very little of any change to the law, whilst two professional planners think that it does make a change and neither agree what that change is. Um, I struggle myself to work out what the change is, and that's why I asked them in the first place. Amendment 98 leaves out section 19 and invites ministers to come back at stage three with a section that's clearer in its terms and intentions. I want briefly to speak to amendment 166 in the name of John Finney, this amendment seeks to bring greater transparency to Section 75 agreements and is motivated in part, uh, and John's part, by the secrecy surrounding the Section 75 agreement that was entered into between Highland Council and Tesco in relation to the Inverness West link. The amendment would require planning authorities to publish and promote the relevant Section 75 instruments so that people are aware of what it involves. And it's important to draw to the attention of <coughs> the committee that the obligation in the <coughs> Uh, the duty contained in the amendment is for planning authorities to publish and promote a relevant instrument in such a manner as they consider sufficient um, to ensure that it's brought to the attention of residents in their area. So it leaves a, a substantial amount of discretion to the planning authority as to how that uh, should be done. And finally, in this group, um, uh, Alex Cole Hamilton's amendment uh, 320. Uh, appears to be helpful to bring greater accountability to the way in which planning authorities use Section 75 agreements. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Uh, and you've spoke to John Finney's amendment? I have spoken to John Finney's amendment. Thank you. Right. Alec Cole Hamilton to speak to Amendment 320. And uh, thank you very much, Convener. I move uh, 320 in my name. Um, this is a, a very light touch amendment to solve a uh, well, go some way to solving a problem and restoring confidence in communities where uh, development happens. Um, all of us, I'm sure, can think of examples in our constituencies where communities have been let down by developers who have made promises in the planning stage, which they have not then delivered on. In my own constituency, AMA uh, developed the Brighouse Park development on the Cram and Can campus with Section 75 commitments to deliver sports pitches and pavilion. Um, they claimed a, a cash flow problem at the end of that development, seeded the um, still slightly contaminated ground with uh, meadow flower and uh, left it at that. Many people had bought properties um, with the expectation of sports facilities um, in the nearby and were sadly let down, but there is no comeback, it seems, on that. Um, I think this is important because this only requires um, planning authorities to produce an annual report detailing commitments undertaken uh, by developers um, and those not yet complied with um, as part of their obligations to plan and gain. Um, that affords a, a greater level of transparency. It um, will create an, a, an inbuilt organisational memory within planning authorities, um, which by the very nature of churn in terms of elected members that sit on committees um, will um, outdate or um, continue on after they leave so that their successors are aware of particularly those developers that um, have a habit of making commitments and then not delivering. Um, it will, I hope, uh, incentivise um, 
uh, developers in terms of making good on those commitments, giving them the sort of idea that uh, they will be under the full glare of public scrutiny if they continually uh, make commitments to planning gain and do not deliver. Um, and as I said earlier, it will um, give uh, planning authorities a healthy scepticism if there are developers who consistently do this um, so that they might not may, may take those protestations with a pinch of salt or those uh, those promises with a pinch of salt. The other part of my amendments um, it speaks to an obligation of developers to tell local residents in the vicinity of the developments uh, what they have committed to undertake. This I think will do two things. Firstly, um, will help uh, with the pressure on local authorities to make good on those commitments, uh, sorry, on, on developers to make good on those commitments. But it will also, uh, to in some cases, um, soften the blow of that development on the communities, win hearts and minds, if you like, within the community, so there's a full understanding, a clear uh, at letterbox um, level understanding of what developers have committed to and what local, uh, local communities can expect to um, derive in terms of benefit from that proposed development. It doesn't propose to be overly bureaucratic. It's uh, something that will be will sit in the public domain. It's about transparency, a clear level of scrutiny, and will hopefully go some way to stop developers thinking they can make these promises and then walk away once they have derived the capital that they hope to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and Graham Simpson to speak to Amendment 317 and other amendments in the group. Um, thanks, convener. Uh, so 317 would allow applicants and authorities to agree changes to planning obligations in a much more efficient manner than they currently do. The amendment does this by revising the modifying and discharging planning obligations section of the bill. The outcome of the amendment would be that a planning authority and an applicant who are in agreement on a proposed change to a planning obligation would not have to go through the statutory section 75A application process to give effect to that change. They could instead agree between themselves to modify the agreement. This would bring the law from this point in line with England and Wales. Not, not that that matters, just thought I'd mention it. At present, Section 75A applications for major developments can take uh, up a disproportionate amount of time. For example, uh, a pair or consortium of home builders working together on a development of several hundred new homes may wish to make layout changes that would increase the total number of new homes to be built. That's quite common. The current wording of Section 75A is generally interpreted by planning authorities as meaning a formal application must be made in order to update, update the planning obligation. And that means a Section 75A application for a simple and agreed change where the only interested and notifiable parties are the planning authority and the applicant clogs up the development management system and can sometimes take several years to resolve. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So the amendment is an attempt to make things slicker and more streamlined, something the Minister has spoken a lot about. Um, now I'll be supporting John Finney's amendment 166 and Alex Cole Hamilton's am amendment 320. Uh, John Finney's amendment is about informing residents of planning obligations. Uh, that's positive. Mr Cole Hamilton's uh, essentially requires planning authorities to publish annual reports on obligations. Uh, that's about transparency and I was thinking back when he was speaking to my time as a councillor um, in South Lanarkshire um, and it, it's certainly not common practice that even councillors are told about these so you don't even know what's going on uh, on your own doorstep. Uh, so I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, Mr Whiteman's amendment 98 removes section 19 entirely, uh, which relates to financial agreements in relation to planning obligations. Now, we had a good look at this, and frankly, we're in the same place as Mr. Whiteman. Um, we have no idea what it means. So um, I think um, if the government can clear up the confusion for stage three, that would be welcomed, but we'll be backing Mr. Whiteman uh, at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Minister? Um, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Uh, planning obligations are an important tool for planning authorities, developers and the public. Uh, they are used to ensure that the impacts of development 
are properly addressed, ensuring the developer pays for infrastructure required to make their development acceptable. Uh, we know that communities want that to happen, uh, uh, and it is in all of our interests that uh, planning obligations operate effectively. Uh, we want the uh, use of planning obligations uh, to be consistent and transparent, to avoid confusion uh, in the system. Uh, currently, Section 75 requires that a planning obligation restricts or regulates the development or use of the land to which it relates. Uh, in terms of the current Section 75 3B, uh, the planning obligation can include a requirement for the payment of money. Uh, section 19 of the Bill ensures that there is no doubt that a planning obligation can require a financial payment without having to be worded so that it otherwise restricts the development or use of the land. Now, I have heard what Mr uh, Whiteman has said uh, about the comments of others. Um, you know, I'm quite happy for Mr. Whiteman and others to come and speak to me and officials uh, around about this um, to give you the clarity uh, that you um, require. Um, I uh, am more than happy uh, to go through all of that with members. Um, so. Uh, uh, as it is the case it's at this moment, a planning obligation can require a financial payment without having to be worded so that it otherwise restricts the development or use of the land. However, it does seek to widen the scope of when planning obligations can properly be sought by a planning authority. Obligations must still have a sufficient relationship uh, with the development in question. And the changes made by Section 19 do not alter the general principle that a planning obligation requiring a sum or sums to be paid to the planning authority should be for a planning purpose or objective which should in some way uh, be connected with or relate to the land in question. Um, Amendment 98 in the name of Andy Whiteman would remove the clarifications made by section 19 and I would ask the committee not to support it but I am willing uh, to, to speak to folk further. Uh, amendments 166 from John Finney and 320 from Alex Cole Hamilton uh, both seek to improve the transparency of planning obligations. And I can see merit in this, uh, so that those with an interest can be better informed of the context around planning decisions. A summary of the terms of planning obligations already have to be contained within handling reports, which are kept in the planning register along with a decision notice for the application, and they are open to public inspection, but there is scope to enhance this. Uh, I would be happy to support the publication uh, of the full planning obligation documents. However, I'm concerned that Amendment 166 um, imposes an additional burden, burden on planning authorities uh, by requiring them to promote these documents. It's not clear exactly what this would require. Uh, the development management regulations already includes requirements for publication and notification of various information. I think we can find better ways of making sure planning information is readily available to the public through these regulations and through the improved online systems that the Scottish Government is developing. So I would ask the committee not to support this amendment and allow us to consider what should be required in more detail for secondary legislation. Since planning authorities hold all the other information about planning applications, I think it's more appropriate for them to publish details of planning obligations rather than the applicant, as proposed uh, by Mr Cole Hamilton. Uh, it will be easier for the public to find if the information is all in one place. I can see potential benefits from Amendment 320 and its aim of collating information and statistics on planning obligations. However, I, again, I have concerns about the burden this would place on planning authorities. Section 26 of the Bill uh, will require planning authorities to prepare annual performance reports. The form and content is to be set by regulations. And it seems to me that would be an appropriate place to include planning obligation statistics rather than a standalone report. 
And I would encourage the committee not to support Amendment 320, but I am more than willing to uh, further, have further discussions about how best to make sure this information is available. Uh, finally, in relation to Mr Simpson's Amendment 317, uh, I believe it is important that the process around how planning obligations can be modified or discharged is clear. Uh, section 20 of the Bill uh, would do this. Uh, I appreciate that it is a touch obscure, uh, but firstly it clarifies that a formal application has to be submitted in accordance with Section 75A in order to modify or discharge a planning obligation. And secondly, it in introduces additional flexibility for the decision maker, which isn't available at present. And this allows for the appellant, uh, the applicant, sorry, and the authority to agree to an alternative modi modification rather than the one specified in the application. Amendment 317 would, in actual fact, create a dual process whereby there is a statutory application process for modifying an obligation in accordance with Section 75A, but also an informal process to modify it by agreement without reference to any statutory procedures. And I don't think that that's desirable. That informal process would also bypass other important provisions in Section 75A, including setting out when the modified obligation would apply and protections for other people against whom the planning obligation may be enforceable, who are not involved in the application for modification or discharge. So I don't support Amendment 317, and I would ask the Committee not to support it to avoid these issues. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy, to wind up, press of withdrawal. Uh, thanks very much, um, Convener. Um, the Section 19, from what the Minister is saying, does seem to involve a policy change, um, a change in the law, rather than just a, a clarification. Um, the Minister said he's happy to discuss this. There's lots of things to be discussed <laughs> between now and stage three. Yeah, we say. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm genuinely concerned that, as I said, two very senior and experienced planning professionals read this and took different meanings from it. And that, they might, that may be because they didn't read it very carefully, didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. I, 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 I wouldn't seek to presume, but it, 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 um, it concerned me that a provision could be interpreted in very different ways by different people, and it concerned me that the government's view was that this wasn't making a change in policy. Um, I'm, I'm thinking my feet here as to whether to press this or not, because I mean I generally don't want to create any extra work for anyone, but um, I do... I am prepared to concede to, to the minister. If, if he, this is a serious, a serious point about understanding. If this, is, if this amendment, if this, if section 19 does involve a policy change, I think that should be very, made very, very clear. If it allows planning authorities to do things that they cannot now do, that should be made very, very clear. If it merely provides greater clarity to what they can do just now, but it doesn't appear that they can do. Well, that's a different matter. Um, so I'm prepared on this occasion not to press Amendment 98, but I would urge the Minister to... I mean, I can, I can, I can let him know... The, I mean, Homes for Scotland, for example, don't like this amendment because they interpret it in a certain way, and I have a lot of sympathy with that. The other planning professional to whom I spoke thought can it changed policy, and no argument was made for that. Um, if I could maybe intervene on uh, Mr Whiteman, um, because there is no um, real change in scope here. I understand that Mr Whiteman um, has had conflicting views from, from folk. I think the base bet, because there's a flurry of paper coming to me here, um, often which has got uh, various uh, bits and pieces of uh, legalese within it. I think it would be better, much better, if we sat down and discussed exactly what the implications of this are. I would urge Mr Whiteman not to press it today. Um, uh, Mr Whiteman knows uh, that I'm a man of my word in these regards. We will have these discussions and we will give him the full explanations that he requires round about 
about this, which may um, help him uh, in terms of making decisions about the future, uh, but may also help the folk that he has been talking to uh, get uh, uh, some, uh, with some clarity. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. And just to conclude uh, in winding up, my interest in this will be to satisfy myself that if there are policy changes that involved in this, that those are policy changes that I can support. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the clarity I'll be seeking between now and stage three. If, if it involves policy changes that may affect um, the interest of people engaging in the planning system, the interests of applicants or developers, um, <coughs> then it may well be that I would be seeking to um, remove this at stage three. And I hope discussions can bring clarity as to which direction we go in that so we don't end up obviously with these things hanging to the, to, to, to the last minute. And I, I, I take the Minister's word, so I will not be pressing Amendment 98. Thank you very much. In that case, uh, Andy Whiteman wishes to withdraw his amendment. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? Thank you. The amendment is therefore withdrawn. The question is that section 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Section 19 is agreed to. I call amendment 166 in the name of John Finney, already debated with amendment 98. Uh, Andy, you are moving in his behalf? Moving. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 166 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 166? Four. Those opposed? Three. Amendment 166 is passed. I call Amendment 320 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 98. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved, convener. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 320 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. Amendment 320 has been agreed to. I call Amendment 317 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 98. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 317 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. The question now is that Section 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Section 20 is agreed to. I call Amendment 145 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 257. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Moved, convener. The question is that Amendment 145 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 145? Two. Those opposed? Five. Amendment 145 falls. I call Amendment 146 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 257. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Moved. Okay. The question is that Amendment 146 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 146? Four. Those opposed? Three. Amendment 146 is agreed to. I call Amendment 314 in the name of Ruth Maguire, grouped with Amendments 333 and 315. Ruth Maguire to move Amendment 314 and speak to all amendments in the group. Welcome, Ruth. Good morning, Convener. Um, and I should say at the outset, I only intend to speak to my own amendments this morning. Um, my amendments address an issue which has been raised um, with me by the local councillor, Davina McTiernan, by a community group, by individuals, and indeed the local authority themselves have been making representations for a number of years. The Town and Country Planning, um, County of Air No. 1 Special Development Order, 1953, was made on the 28th of July 1953 and came into operation in August of that year. Subject to certain specific exceptions, the Special Development Order permits the carrying out of any development at Ardeer Stevenson without the requirement to obtain planning permission from the local planning authority. At the time the Special Development Order was made, Ardeer was a major industrial complex operated by a single user, ICI. However, the area covered is now in different ownership and there is no longer the large industrial factory at Ardeer. The absence of any planning application process means that there's no process to evaluate material considerations such as traffic, parking, design, noise, environmental impact, etc. In particular, it should be noted that the Ardeer site is adjacent to the Garnick and Irvine estuaries, and it's an extensive um, regional habitat and really important. The existence of the Special Development Order provides no means of either protecting this or ensuring 
ensuring that any impacts from development can be considered. For example, the Special Development Order grants planning permission without the need for an environmental impact assessment. There is no mechanism by which an environmental impact assessment can be required for development at Ardeer, as there is no need for planning permission in the Special Development Area. The existence of the Special Development Order also, order also operates as an impediment to development. Inward investors are likely to be deterred from investment, particularly tourism, housing or other um, clean uses, if any development can simply appear on their boundary without any proper planning process. Funders will inevitably want a proper planning process for any development, rather than one which may be challengeable on the basis it fails to have regard to environmental traffic and other impacts of the development. Given that the Ardeer Peninsula is immediately across the River Irvine and forms the north side of Irvine Harbour, the Special Development Order is also arguably a restraint to the development of Irvine Harbour side and Irvine Harbour. As um, colleagues from all parties, um, both in the local authority and our two parliaments, continue to push the UK and Scottish governments for the Ayrshire Growth Deal and proposals for development at Irvine Harbourside, Irvine Harbour and the Ardeer Peninsula. The need for a solution to this problem is really quite pressing. Um, you'll have the details of the amendment in front of you, so I'll not read those out to you, but if I can just um, summarise the, the, the purpose and effect. Um, section 30 brackets 2 of the 1997 Act enables planning permission to be granted by a development order in relation to land specified in the order. This power is now rarely, if indeed ever used, but there exists various old special development orders made under previous legislation. Section 77 of the Act currently sets out provisions for the payment of compensation if planning permission granted by a development order is withdrawn or modified. This includes the circumstances where a development order is revoked. If a development order is revoked and an application is made within 12 months for planning permission for development previously permitted by the Special Development Order, then compensation is payable by the planning authority if that planning permission is refused or um, granted subject to different conditions to those included in the Special Development Order. This mirrors the provision that where a planning permission not granted by a development order is revoked or modified, the planning authority is liable to pay compensation. The compensation is limited to where a claim made within the prescribed time frame shows that a person interested in the land has incurred abortive expenditure or otherwise sustained loss or damage directly attributable to the revocation or modification. However, because of the broad nature of the permission usually granted by a development order, the possible compensation for loss or damage is likely to be higher in those cases. Amendment 314 repeals section 77 and introduces instead a power for the Scottish ministers to make regulations concerning the compensation that may be payable on revocation of an order. The effect of this amendment is to enable Scottish ministers to use regulations to set out the circumstances in which compensation may be payable, set out what the compensation is to cover, set out the manner in which the level of compensation is to be calculated to require a claim for such compensation to be made within a certain period and specify how such a claim should be made and the information which should be included, and apply or disapply any of the provisions of Part 4 of the 1997 Act with or without modifications. Amendment 315 repeals various references to Section 77 elsewhere in the 1997 Act. I'll finish there, Sabina. Thank you very much, Monica, to speak to Monica Glynne, to speak to Amendment 333 and all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Amendment 333, um, similar to Ruth McGuire, there's a, there's a story uh, behind it, and it's, it's rooted in a very sort of local example. Um, so, so bear with me. Um, I won't give all the details, but we have a situation um, where planning consent is, is withdrawn, is revoked very rarely, um, if, if ever at all. And in, in, in my community, when I was a local councillor in Hamilton, there was a, a planning um, appeal upheld. So permission was effectively granted by the Scottish Government for an incinerator. And, you know, at a cross-party level, everyone was, was upset with that decision. And there was further discussions with the 
with the then Cabinet Secretary because um, he didn't personally make the decision. It was delegated to, to officials, to, to a reporter. And through those discussions, um, the, the, the option of having the consent revoked was discussed. And uh, one of our, our colleagues, uh, Richard Lyle, MSP, who, who at that time was Central Scotland MSP, and he's now the member for Uddingston Bells Hill, um, he um, raised the issue of, of revocation, as did many others, including myself, and, and he wrote to the local authority, um, South Lancashire Council, to ask them to use um, revocation powers under the, the Town and Country Planning Act 1997. Um, and the Scottish Government were also sympathetic to, to the power being used, but the sticking point became that even if the Scottish ministers had used the revocation powers available to them, the, any liability for compensation would fall to the planning authority. So there could be a financial burden uh, for a decision that was taken by Scottish ministers, but this a financial penalty, if you like, would rest with the, the planning authority. So when I've been looking at this bill, um, again, it's a very niche issue, um, but like the one that Ruth Maguire has raised, I think it is an important one. So um, I appreciate that the minister because we had a chat yesterday and I know he has some concerns about this um, and I did take a steer from the Parliament's legislation team but I'll concede if it's not um, drafted as, as perfectly as it could be but that's the intention behind it. It's where we have these situations where ministers for good reason might want to revoke a planning consent that any liability for compensation shouldn't then transfer down to, to a planning authority. Um, I'll admit, when I looked at um, Ruth McGuire's amendments, having not been aware of the backstory, I wasn't quite sure, but, but I'm happy to support Ruth McGuire with her amendments, and I look forward to hearing from the Minister about my own amendments, um, 333. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, the introduction of the planning system denied landowners the right to develop their land unless permitted to do so. So once a site has planning permission, uh, a landowner or developer should be able to commit to investing confident that the principle of development has been accepted. Uh, there can occasionally be circumstances, though, when it may be appropriate to revoke or modify a planning permission and so, again, the, the, remove the right to develop and the 1997 Act specifically allows for that. For example, if uh, an administrative error uh, has led to permission being granted mistakenly or where a significant change has taken place, which means that the proposed development would no longer be acceptable. But in these very rare circumstances, property owners are entitled to expect to be fairly compensated for loss of given rights to develop their property. The provisions for compensation are a long-established part of the planning regime and have been included in the system to ensure fairness if it becomes necessary later to revoke or modify a planning permission after it has been granted. Uh, crucially, uh, blanket removal of these provisions could put the planning system, the bill, uh, in conflict with the European Convention on Human Rights. Entirely removing these provisions would also risk far greater uncertainty in the system. For example, following a change of administration, might new elected members be tempted or pressured to revoke a consent which had been granted controversially under the previous administration. This would pose a fundamental problem for planning. It would erode and undermine the value of planning permission and in so doing uh, significantly undermine investor confidence. There has been no consultation on this very serious proposed change. For these reasons, I cannot support Amendment 333 uh, in the name of Monica Lennon and I would ask Ms Lennon not to press it. I do support the aims of Ruth Maguire's amendments. Moving on. Very briefly, yeah. Um, well, it will inform my decision whether or not I press Amendment 333. Um, I take the point that perhaps moving the whole of part four is, is quite drastic, but the particular point I made about if, if ministers 
uh, for their own reasons uh, wish to, to revoke or modify a consent um, under section, I think it's 68 of the Town and Country Planning Act 97. Um, is it fair that any compensa compensation liability should fall to, to the planning authority? That's, that's the issue that I'm trying to address. Question, the question there is, and we've not had this discussion, where does the payment of compensation lie with? Does it uh, 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 lie with the government or does it lie with the planning authority? Um, and I have to say, when I, once again, this is an amendment um, where Ms Lennon is obviously trying to do one thing, uh, but the way that this is drafted has immense unintended consequences here. Um, and we have not consulted on this. Um, we had, uh, as Ms Lennon uh, rightly points out, some discussion around about um, these matters yesterday. Um, um, but um, I've offered Ms Lennon the opportunity uh, to talk to me further or to the officials around about this, but this amendment has immense unintended consequences and doesn't actually just do what Ms Lennon is, is seeking so to do. In that spirit, I'm, I'm, I'm minded to, to not press the Minister, but the very specific point is about if Ministers revoke or modify a consent, would you be willing to engage with me to make sure that it's not the planning authority that, that pays the price for that? I, I'm, I'm willing to have discussions, but I am not uh, at this moment uh, willing uh, to say that I will move one way or other on this issue. Um, I think that there's a lot of work that has to be uh, done uh, around about this. Um, I do wish that you know there had been some discussion earlier around about this. There is the opportunity now um, to discuss, but I'm guaranteeing nothing here, convener. Um, if I can move on um, to Ms Maguire's uh, amendments 314 and 315, and I do support the aims of these amendments and the reasonable approach taken. Uh, there will sometimes be circumstances, sometimes be circumstances, where it is appropriate for the Scottish ministers to modify or even remote, revoke permitted development rights under a development order, whether a general or a special development order. In these cases, there may well be circumstances where it may not be appropriate to pay the amount of compensation that might have been envisaged when the order was made. There is clearly a difference between planning permissions expressly granted by a planning authority following detailed considerations of the merits of a particular application on the one hand and a general permitted development right which apl applies across the country or a specific part of it to certain development as described in a development order. Some development orders were made many, many years ago, or even decades ago, uh, as in the case of this one. And the land use policy framework may have changed significantly. I agree that we should take the opportunity through this bill to ensure that where a planning authority revokes or modifies a development order, any compensation work for which the authority becomes liable is appropriate and proportionate. It will require a very careful and very considered approach to make sure that this is done fairly. Should the committee agree Ms Maguire's amendments, the Scottish Government will, of course, engage fully with planning authorities and others who may be affected before making any regulations under this power and give full consideration to the ECHR issues relating to compensation for the loss of property rights. I ask the committee to agree amendments 314 and 315 in the name of Ruth Reguire, and I would ask Ms Lennon not to press uh, amendment 333, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Ruth Maguire to wind up and press or withdraw, please. Um, I'll simply press my amendments. Can Thank you. Know? Right, the question is that Amendment 314 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Uh, amendment 314 is agreed to. I call Amendment 332 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 259. Andy, are you moving for John? Moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 332 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Those in favour of Amendment 332? Four. Those opposed? Three. Amendment 332 has been passed. I call Amendment 147 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 257. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Move. Thank 
you. The question is that Amendment 147 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 147? One. Uh, those opposed? Five. And, uh, and the right man abstains. That's, so that's 151. One. Therefore, the Amendment 147 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 326 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with amendments as shown in groupings. Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 326 and speak to all amendments in the group. Sorry, convenience, I've been <coughs> losing my place. <laughs> right, we're now on to a new section. Uh -huh. um, training and performance of planning authorities. So, thank you very much. Um, amendments in, in my name in this group fall into three distinct groups themselves. 326, 327 and 328 are, are one group. 310 kind of stands on its own and 311, 12 and 13 is the third. The planning bill and the wider review of which it is part places a number of new duties on local, uh, on, on planning authorities which of course will have um, resource implications. This at a time, as the committee has heard several times already, that res when resources in the planning service are, are scarce and continuing to fall. In spite of this, we've seen consistent improvements uh, in the speed of planning decision making. There's also increasing understanding across the board that we need to focus more on measuring the quality of decision making and planning. Planning is not just about making decisions uh, quickly, but about making the right decisions that ultimately contribute to making better places. The um, penalty uh, clause uh, provisions in the Town Country Planning Act 1997 were introduced through Section 55 of the Regulatory Reform Scotland Act 2014. They allow Scottish ministers to vary planning fees where a planning authority is deemed to be performing unsatisfactorily. The provisions have never been used. It seems uh, counterproductive to threaten to withdraw funding from planning authorities that need to improve. The improvements in planning that this bill seeks to drive will require skills and resource support for those planning authorities responsible for implementing them. Amendments 326, 327 and 328 would make a clear statement of intent uh, to this end. Uh, these provisions have never had uh, support within the uh, planning community and I'm pleased to bring them forward for consideration in this uh, bill. Amendment 310 provides um, for flexibility and a transition period in relationship to the bill's duties for mandatory planning. It enables members of planning committees, uh, Amendment 310 if passed, would enable members of planning committees to continue to take part in decisions provided they have begun any statutory training and therefore it, it, it softens and provides uh, a transitionary period from the rather hard provisions in the bill as to whether members of planning authorities have or have not um, undertaken the proposed statutory uh, training. Amendments Apologies. Amendments 3, 11, 12 and 13 uh, seek to ensure that any mandatory training that's required of members of planning authorities is required of all decision makers, and that includes Scottish ministers. The stage one report recommended that the mandatory training provisions be removed from the bill. But if they were to remain in the bill, that ministers should be subject to them uh, also. In the government's response to the committee, it outlined why this was not possible, due to the collective nature of Scottish ministers in whose name determines, determinations are made. Amendment 311 makes this fundamental change, that is to say that Scottish ministers are to be subject to mandatory training provisions within the planning system as decision makers like all others. Amendment 312 overcomes, in my view, the objection raised by Scottish ministers made by the, by the, by the, by the, by the minister himself in his response by uh, providing that regulations can be uh, laid, I propose this be the laid only uh, procedure, that names individuals that would be specified who become, for the purposes of any mandatory training, the individuals required to undergo that uh, training. <coughs> Amendment 313 is consequential and makes it clear that the scope of 25 
uh, one, whereby functions can be transferred to another planning authority or to Scottish ministers, extends only to a local authority. Um, it should read planning authority or national park. It cannot extend to Scottish ministers because if Amendment 311 is passed, then this would allow ministers to direct that their own functions be exercised by someone else. Uh, this is a rather complicated um, uh, uh, sequence here. The amendment becomes redundant if amendments 23 and 24 are passed. To, to be clear, as a matter of policy, um, I, I do support a mandatory training for planning decision makers, but it must apply to all. Uh, if my amendments <laughs> 3, uh, 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 11, 12 and 13 fall, then I will be supporting Graeme Simpson's Amendment 23 and 24. I also support Graeme Simpson's Amendment 17 to delete Section 26 of the Bill, whose provisions cut across the collaborative work that has been undertaken to date to continuously improve outcomes of the planning system. I support Amendment 268, uh, but I oppose Amendment 18, uh, which would introduce extra bureaucracy and administration in relationship to provisions that already exist um, not just in this bill, but in previous legislation. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Graeme Simpson to speak to Amendment 23 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thanks a lot, convener. Um, I'll discuss amendments uh, 23, 24 and 17 before moving on to 18. Uh, amendments 23 and 24 remove the requirement for councillors to undergo mandatory training by removing sections 24 and 25 of the bill. My amendment 17 removes section 26 from the face of the bill. This section sets out how Scottish ministers can assess the performance of planning authorities and includes, includes powers to take on an appointed person or planning czar. Let's start with that one. On performance, the bill does three things. There would be a statutory requirement, requirement for every planning authority to produce an annual performance report with their form, content and process for production set out by ministers in regulations. Ministers would have the power to appoint a national planning performance czar to report back to them on performance standards. Ministers would have the power to appoint a person to conduct an assessment of one or more planning authorities performance to report on their findings with recommendations and grant ministers powers to pursue those recommended improvements. Now, what constitutes poor performance is not defined in the bill. It leaves the way open for the whole process to become very political. If a council takes a series of planning decisions that conflict with the agenda of any Scottish government, now or in the future, of any colour, they could determine that they are, quotes, underperforming. It's a dangerous President. The committee produced a hard-hitting and well-received stage one report into this bill. It was agreed unanimously. Let me read what it said about section 26. We note that planning authorities have for a number of years voluntarily reported on their planning performance. We received no evidence that this approach has been flawed. Indeed, as Cosler explained in its written evidence, the decision by Scottish Government to legislate on reporting came as a surprise and that it was, quote, not expecting the inclusion of the National Planning Performance Coordinator in the bill as discussions with the Government were ongoing. Kozler comment that it is the proposals on assessment which give us most concern. As far as we're aware, the appointment of an assessor for local government performance has never recently been discussed. The report goes on. The committee sees no need or justification for the bill's proposals on performance and recommends that section 26 of the bill be removed. We consider that the Scottish Government should continue to work collaboratively with COSLA. Close quotes. Amendment 17 simply does what the committee said should happen. I've had extensive talks with COSLA on this and other aspects of the bill and they agree with the committee on this. Amendment 23 removes section 24, <laughs> and Amendment 24 removes section 25. Section 24 proposes that future regulations will set out the training requirements for members of planning authorities who sit on planning committees or on local review bodies. In fact, 
all councillors, mm -hmm. every single one of them, could have to take, take decisions on planning matters, so this applies to them all. It requires that this training be completed before such members make planning decisions, mm -hmm. and Section 25 sets out the arrangements to ensure continuity of the planning service should sufficient members not have completed this training. Handing powers to other councils. The policy memorandum explains that regulations will specify a requirement for attendance and or completion of an exam by members of the planning authorities before they may be involved in the making of planning decisions by their authority. Now my view on this, shaped by 10 years as a councillor who sat on a planning committee, is that they're elected to take decisions affecting their areas and it's quite simply an affront to democracy for someone to then set them a test to rule on whether they're bright enough to do so. In any case, the minister himself has refused to take an exam despite being the ultimate arbiter on planning matters. What do the committee have to say on all this? Our report reads thus. We agree that in undertaking their functions on a planning committee, it's important that councillors are clear about the matters upon which they should base their decisions. We consider, therefore, that councillors should attend training on key aspects of the planning system. We do not agree, however, that it should be mandatory, and accordingly we recommend that the Scottish Government amends the bill to remove this provision. We consider any training in planning should be considered as part of a continuous professional development programme for councillors. Uh, and we invite COSLA and the Improvement Service to consider broadening the range of training available to uh, councillors on planning to include best practice in community engagement in planning, equalities and human rights duties, challenges in urban and rural settings, and environmental and sustainability duties. If the amendments we recommend are not made, then we consider that all decision takers in planning, and this is uh, what Andy Whiteman said earlier, should be subject to the same training requirements. This includes all relevant councillors and Scottish ministers." Close quotes. In his response to the committee on May the 24th, the minister said, the Scottish Government is clear that planning ministers receive appropriate training on their role and functions when they are appointed. <laughs> the response declared that imposing a training requirement would, quote, raise the risk that ministers' planning functions could not be carried out, which is precisely what the bill proposes for councillors. Talk about hypocrisy. Councils do train their members on all sorts of things, mm -hmm. including planning. They don't need to be ordered to in law. I'm not just saying this. I know this having been a councillor, but I thought I'd just check in any case. I wrote to every single council in Scotland to see if they train their councillors in planning. 28 of the 32 wrote back and all 28 train their councillors. Most also do regular refreshing training. So this part of the bill is simply unnecessary because it's happening anyway. My amendment 18 tackles performance in a rather softer manner than the one in the bill by calling for an annual report from councils detailing the number of planning applications dealt with, the outcomes and times taken to process. The amendment creates transparency over performance without uh, undermining council's authority. Andy Whiteman's amendment 310 sets out guidelines on when training should be complete, but since I want this removed, I won't be supporting it. His amendment 311 tackles the ministeri ministerial training issue, but for the same reason, I won't back that. Uh, 312 simply adds a bit of detail to 311. The Minister's Amendment 268 is an amendment to 26, which of course I want to see removed. I'll be supporting Mr Whiteman's uh, amendments 326, 327 and 328. I believe they're uh, beneficial and will improve the planning process. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Minister. You know, before I, I don't know, the mic's gone up uh, sound wise there. Uh, before I, I launch into all of the uh, technical aspects of, of these amendments, uh, can I say, uh, first of all, uh, that in terms of the stakeholder engagement, the consultation, um, there was overwhelming, 
overwhelming support um, for uh, the training of elected members from all stakeholders. Um, and in terms of performance, again, you know, there was uh, support um, for what we are trying to do here um, from stakeholders across the board. Uh, and when I'm talking about stakeholders, I'm talking about communities uh, and individuals. Uh, and from my experience um, as a, a councillor over um, a 13-year period, uh, one of the things that frustrated me greatly um, was going to extremely important meetings uh, which would be deciding uh, things like the uh, passing of a local development plan where folk were sitting with papers uh, in front of them largely unopened. Um, and I do think um, that uh, more of them would have been opened uh, if the right training had, had gone in there. Um, performance, convener, is important uh, to everyone in the planning system. I'll take an uh, intervention from Mr Simpson. Yeah, it will, it, 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 it will, be, will be brief. Um, so if, if, whether councillors have opened their papers or not is not affected by uh, training. They could be trained and not have their papers open. I really think that's an irrelevant point. It's not. It's a very relevant point uh, because uh, in my early years, before the days of local development plans, when we were dealing with a local plan, um, I spoke to a number of members at that point who quite clearly uh, did not understand what was put in front of them. Training would have helped in that regard. Um, and I think that this is extremely uh, important. And it is extremely important for stakeholders. Um, performance is extremely important to everyone uh, with a stake in the planning system. Uh, and this is not just about uh, the big developers demanding faster processing. Householders, small businesses, communities all want an efficient service. And communities uh, want to be assured that the planning authority is engaging effectively and is creating good outcomes in their areas. Uh, and a lot of the correspondence that crosses my desk from co communities uh, is around about performance in particular areas. Uh, and everyone wants to know uh, that the authority is making good decisions based on a sound understanding of planning principles. Our per performance pr proposals, as I've said, were some of the most popular measures in our consultation. Uh, and so the committee will not be surprised to hear that I absolutely oppose Mr Simpson's proposals to remove these sections from the bill. In its stage one report, uh, the committee recommended that the Scottish Government should continue to work collaboratively uh, with its partners, enhancing the current planning performance framework. And I am committed to doing that. And we will continue uh, to work with the High Level Group on Performance, uh, with COSLA and other stakeholders to agree how best to measure performance and identify areas for improvement. Uh, we will also work with them uh, to develop the role of the Planning Performance Coordinator, which is intended to support planning authorities and help share good practice, and to draw up the criteria and process for initiating an assessment of performance. But I do believe these approaches need some statutory backing and ultimately um, some sanction to deal with authorities that fail to improve despite all the support. And the package of measures introduced by Section 26 will provide that positive and supportive framework that was envisaged by the independent panel. I don't believe that Mr Simpson's proposed annual report is any way a helpful alternative. There is general agreement that we need to consider performance in a more rounded way, even if we disagree how that should be achieved. Requiring a report that reduces planning performance to the most basic of numbers will not support that aim and sends entirely the wrong message about what we value. In my proposals, I've taken on board some of the specific concerns raised about the provisions. Amendment 268 uh, removes the provision that a person could be subject to criminal proceedings.
if they do not provide information requested in connection with a performance assessment. Although this is a standard performance uh, pr standard provision that exists, for example, in relation to school inspections, I'm satisfied that it's not necessary here. If an appointed person is not provided with information they need to carry out the assessment, that is likely to be mentioned in the report, and I think that is su uh, sufficient encouragement. I've also accepted the recommendation of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, that the power to prescribe the functions of the coordinator should be subject to affirmative procedure. Uh, we'll come to that in the next group because it is a composite amendment covering a number of regulation making powers. Turning to Mr Whiteman's amendments and fees, um, the Scottish Government has made clear um, for many years that any increase in fees must be linked with improved performance. This is of particular importance when planning authorities, COSLA and the RTPI have been asking for us to raise planning fees to enable full cost recovery. People are concerned that increased fees do not necessarily go to funding the planning service. I don't think I can commit to increasing planning fees towards full cost recovery without sufficient mechanisms in place to ensure that those fees are reinvested in the service and are leading to improvements in performance. While it is for local authorities to decide how their income should be spent, robust performance monitoring should ensure that there is appropriate investment to meet agreed performance indicators. Mr Whiteman's amendments would remove the ability of ministers to reflect the performance of individual authorities and the fees that they are able to charge. Using the penalty clause would always be a last resort, but removing it would leave Scottish ministers with few concrete options to use where planning authorities do not make expected improvements. Moving on to the training of elected members, um, not only was this overwhelmingly supported in our consultation, but people expressed surprise that it was not already mandatory. Uh, ensuring that decisions are made in a consistent manner and based on in solid, in solid planning knowledge is an essential part of good performance and essential to maintaining trust in the system. I urge members not to discard something that people all across the system want to see. Again, I listened to the arguments and I was prepared to bring forward an amendment to remove the power to transfer planning functions to another authority or to ministers where insufficient members have been trained. And I've concluded that transferring decisions to another authority would not actually lead to faster decisions uh, and that the reputational risk, uh, should members not be able to take decisions, should ensure that that, that issue is resolved swiftly. Mr. Simpson beat me to lodging that amendment. However, I've put in the consequential amendment he missed um, in section 32. Uh, this committee also suggested that if compulsory training was to be retained, that ministers should also uh, be included. Now, let me put this on the record again. Um, I am committed to undertake training. Uh, I have received training on planning, uh, both in my roles as a councillor and as a minister. Um, and it feels like at the moment that every day is a training session in planning uh, for me. However, as I noted uh, in my response to the Committee Stage 1 report, to require that in statute, statute raises all kinds of difficulties. Section 52.3 of the Scotland Act provides that the statutory functions of the Scottish ministers shall be exercisable by any member of the Scottish Government. This is different from the way planning authorities are constituted. If one or more members of a planning authority have not completed the training, the authority could substitute members on the planning committee committee or perhaps even change its quorum. 
As I've said, the Scotland Act provides that the statutory functions of the Scottish ministers shall be exercisable by any member of the Scottish Government. This amendment seeks to alter that position and so to alter the effect of the Scotland Act. In addition, if the Scottish ministers were to be prohibited from exercising their functions, then no junior minister or officials acting on their behalf could do so either. I recognise that Mr Whiteman has attempted uh, to unpick this in Amendment 312 uh, by providing for an individual Scottish minister to be designated as responsible for planning and placing the requirement for training on them. Unfortunately, I have to remind him that unpicking the provisions of the Scotland Act is out with the legislative competence of this Parliament. It might be possible under Mr Whiteman's amendment to require a junior minister with responsibility for planning to undergo training as they are not formally members of the Scottish Government, but it would be odd to have a junior minister unable to exercise a function that the Cabinet Secretary could exercise. So I am um, swear to support these amendments. Finally, on Amendment 310, uh, this would mean that a member of a planning authority is considered to have fulfilled the specified training requirements uh, when they have not. It appears that the member could repeatedly start the training and never complete it, or possibly repeatedly fail in any required assessment and start again, but still be allowed to undertake planning functions. That would completely undermine the point of having a training requirement, and I cannot support it. Um, to conclude, um, let me say again that our aim is to work collaborat collaboratively with planning authorities and other stakeholders to define how performance should be assessed, how the planning performance co coordinator can support improved performance, and what training elected members should have to take part in planning decisions. Convener, some members seem to think that I am fixated on a test around about all of this. I am not. But what I am fixated about is that training aspect. I am quite happy to undergo that training myself. Um, uh, that concerns me not one iota. If there was a way um, within legislation for me to have to do that, rather than the unpicking of the Scotland Act, which we cannot do, I would be happy to do that. I believe the statutory framework in this bill as it is uh, will strengthen the collaborative approach and help to demonstrate that we are serious, really serious, about improving performance, uh, performance across the board. And I ask the committee to keep the provisions as they are. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Andy, to wind up, press. <coughs> <coughs> um, so as I said at the, in the opening of this group, I, I do actually support <coughs> provisions for putting training onto statutory footing. Um, I was concerned, however, that reflecting the committee's stage one report that <coughs> were ministers not persuaded that they should be treated equitably, then um, it, that would not be appropriate. I, I've listened carefully to what, carefully to what the minister uh, says, and obviously these stage two debates are, are, are conducted within a rather uh, compressed environment that doesn't allow us a great deal of time to reflect um, on um, uh, what people have said, but I'm prepared to take the Minister's comments in good faith that there would be practical difficulties in relationship to the provisions of the Scotland Act to put in place um, statutory provisions requiring uh, Ministers to undergo this training. I accept that in, 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 in good faith, um, and therefore will not be um, moving amendments 311, 312, and 313. I am um, on the question of performance. Um, this relates to Graham Simpson's amendment uh, 17. Um, I, I've heard what the minister has said there too. I think the provisions in the bill in, in section 26 um, profoundly change, profoundly change the power relationship between planning authorities and Scottish ministers in a way that's not helpful, I don't think. I think it undermines the, um, the autonomy and the authority 
of directly elected members who have responsibility for making decisions about planning matters within their uh, area, and therefore I'm not persuaded by the Minister's arguments uh, against that. Um, this is a complicated group of amendments. I don't think I've got anything else uh, to say. Thank you. Much. Uh, therefore, the question is that Amendment 326 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 2. Uh, sorry, therefore, Amendment 326 is agreed to. No, sorry. sorry. Ah, right, okay. Uh, those in favour of Amendment 326? Those opposed? 5-2, uh, in favour of it. Uh, I call Amendment 264 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 259. Minister, to move formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 264 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 265 in the name of the Minister. Already no, Oh, sorry, I thought you said yes. My apologies. Uh, those in favour? 264. Can I just take the number? 264. Yeah, 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 yeah. 264. Two, yeah, two, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, five. Those opposed? Two. 264 is agreed to. Sorry about that, Graham. I call Amendment 265 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 259. Minister to move formally. Moved, Convener. The question is that Amendment 265 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <laughs> uh, those in favour of Amendment 265? Five. Those opposed? Two. Okay, the amendment 265 is agreed to. I call amendment 327 in the name of Andy Whiteman. Already debated with amendment 326. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 327 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Those opposed? 5-2 in favour for 327. I call amendment 328. Okay, Jason. I call Amendment 328 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 326. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 328 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Those in favour? Five. Those opposed? Two. Amendment 328 is agreed to. I call Amendment 321 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 259. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 321 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 321? Five. Those opposed? Two. Amendment 321 is agreed to. I call Amendment 266 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 259. Minister, to move forward. Move, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 266 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, 266 agreed to. <laughs> I call Amendment 16 in the name of Graham Simpson. Already debated with Amendment 259. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. The question, the question therefore, is that Section 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. Thank you. I call Amendment 333 in the name of Monica Lennon. Already debated with Amendment 314. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Yeah, move on. Yeah, okay. I, I'll call Amendment 329 in the name of Graham Simpson in a group on its own. Graham Simpson to move and speak to Amendment 329. And on it, I would appreciate brevity from everybody because I, I would like to finish this section very soon. Uh, convener, I'm going to uh, make your day. Um, I will be very brief. Uh, the amendment was tabled in, in response to an article that was sent in Scottish Planner uh, where it was argued that authorities. Uh, issue fixed penalty notices for breaching an enforcement notice and it's then possible to pay the fine and carry on as before. Now, uh, I've spoken to the Minister uh, about this uh, last week. Very useful discussion. Um, he's pointed out issues which he may well touch on. Uh, I'm happy at this point to withdraw the amendment uh, on the basis that the Minister is aware of the issue and is looking at it. Use that, that for every opening at the midlife so much easier. Thank you, Graham. I appreciate that. Minister. So, uh, anyone in the committee wants to hear all of the reasoning for that, convener, I'm happy uh, to pass in speaking here if that helps you. Considerably. Thank you. Uh, Graham Simpson has wishes to withdraw his amendment. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? Thank you. That amendment is withdrawn. And that the question is that section 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. 
Uh, and that brings us to the end of the public session. Uh, if I could ask. Yeah, I've, yeah. Yeah, I, I've got a family thing I need to oh, go to. Right, my, okay. need to do my granddaughter. Yeah. I've got to catch a Sorry, can I, I can I thank the Minister, his officials and all the other MSPs who attended today. Day 7 of Stage 2, which is the final day, will take place on the 14th of November. Any remaining amendments to the Bill should be lodged by 12 noon on Thursday, 8th of November. And that concludes the public part of the meeting. Sorry, I'll switch it up. Yeah.